Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our meeting this evening of Cape Breton Regional Municipality Council for Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. Um, I will begin this evening acknowledging <clears throat> that we have gathered here in Unamagi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, we work completely and wholly in the spirit of reconciliation here. Um, we will begin by calling the roll. Uh, I will ask Tanya, please, to call the roll call, and then we'll go into our mo moment of silent reflection. Okay. Mayor McDougall? And Councillor Gordon McDonald? Here. Deputy Mayor McMullen? Here. Councillor Cyril McDonald? Here. Councillor Gillespie? Here. Councillor Eldon McDonald? Here. Councillor Perouche? Here. Councillor Parsons? Here. Councillor Edwards? Here. Councillor Tracy? Here. Councillor Brookswagger? Here. Councillor O'Quinn? Here. Councillor Green? Here. Thank you, Tanya. Um, now I am going to call upon Councillor Steve Gillespie. Um, he will be paying tribute to two fine, fine gentlemen that we have lost recently. The first being Rod MacArthur and second, Murray Johnson. Steve? You're on mute, Steve. You're on mute. You have to start again. My apologies. Thank you. On June 1st, Roderick Blaze MacArthur passed away at the Northside General Hospital at age 85. Roddy, as he was known, was a humble, down-to-earth, easygoing, approachable man who loved his family and his community. As municipal councillor, Roddy served the residents of Westmount, Point Edward, Edwardsville and area with the County of Cape Breton for 12 years and then in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality for six years. As an elected official, Roddy served on many committees and community organizations, such as the Library Board, both locally and regionally, created a clothing depot at the Women's Institute of Nova Scotia. But Roddy told me that he was most proud of being involved in creating what is now known as the Westmount Canada Day celebrations at Petersfield Park. Roddy was a lifelong volunteer and served when asked. He was an active member of the Holy Rosary Parish as both lector and Eucharist server. He was a founding member, fourth degree knight and past grand knight of the Knights of Columbus Moses M. Cody Council. He was a member of the Westmount Volunteer Fire Department and a member of the Kiwanis Cape Breton Golden K, which is where I first met and worked closely with Roddy on many joint Kiwanis Club projects. Roddy was also well known as the voice of stock car racing in Sydney. Motormouth, as he was known, will always be remembered for giving each driver a special nickname and his unique sayings, such as, these are the bulldogs, what a revolting development this is, and of course, away we go. Roddy served as a member of the Cape Breton Health Board of Directors, the McGilvery Guest Home Board of Directors, the Steel Center Credit Union Board of Directors. He volunteered his time for the Income Tax Seniors Program and was always seen volunteering his time at Harborstone, McGilvery, and <laughs> Gold Retirement Homes. He was also seen daily at the Information Center at the Regional Hospital. Roddy was an avid sports fan, especially the Blue Jays, Toronto Maple Leafs, Cape Breton Oilers, and our Cape Breton Eagles. I appreciated Roddy's political advice and his calls of support when I was elected. He always had time to share his experiences and ideas with me, whether I wanted to hear them or not. Roddy MacArthur is su survived by his loving wife and camping buddy of 62 years, Judy. His children, Beth, Kim, Kevin, Troy, and Jody. 11 grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren, his siblings, Anne and John, and his extended family. 
and I thank him for the service to his community. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now we will pay tribute to Murray Johnson. Thank you again, Mayor McDougall. On Thursday, May 27th, our community lost a former municipal councilor named Murray Johnson. Big Murr, or Turtle, as he was known, was a graduate of the Nova Scotia Teachers Community College and St. of X University. Murray spent over 30 years in the teaching profession. Murray was loved and well-respected by his many students and co-workers over the years. But education wasn't his only career path because with a voice like Murray Johnson's, he dabbled in broadcast journalism with stints at CHER and CJCB radio in their news departments. Friends and family coined him the Ted Knight of local radio especially regarding his role of CJCB's popular talk show called Talkback, where Murray engaged, informed, and sometimes infuriated his listeners and guests. After leaving radio, Murray stayed involved in broadcasting, politics, and his community by hosting online talk shows and volunteering in his community and with, just recently, the Nova Scotians for Equalization Fairness. Murray had a passion for politics and served as a town councillor and deputy mayor of Sydney Mines, and then a municipal councillor for the Cape Breton Regional Municipality from 1995 to 2000. Murray reflected back on his time as a town and municipal councillor fondly and served his community with pride. Murray had an abiding love of the written word. He enjoyed a cold beer on a hot day, his Yankees and his Red Wings, the thunder of hooves at the local racetrack, and as he put it, an exciting game of curling. Murray also loved the opportunity to embarrass his children at any point in time. And if you stopped to talk to him, he would talk the ear of virtually anyone. Murray and I worked together at CJCB Radio for many years and shared a love of our community as well as talking about politics at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. After I was elected to council, Murray would call me after every council meeting. If I did something right, Murray would call and say, well done, neighbor. If he and I disagreed on a topic, he just told me to do better next time. Every person I know in the broadcast industry does a Murray Johnson impression. And why not? Murray Johnson had one of the most recognizable radio voices in Cape Breton. It was a true and a genuine voice that pulled you in and taught you something. And is one of the reasons why Murray was such a good teacher and broadcaster. Murray will be missed by his community, his children, Kirsten and Aaron, his beloved grandson, brother Ken, and his companion, Judy. And I would just like to say goodbye to my neighbor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Two very lovely, lovely tributes. Um, <clears throat> next, I will call upon Councillor Glenn Perouche to pay tribute to the late Ian McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It is with heavy hearts that we pass along the news that Ian McIntosh, longtime librarian with the Cape Breton Regional Library, passed away on May 22nd, 2021. Ian was dedicated, highly respected, and much admired within Nova Scotia's library community. He held the title of Regional Librarian at CBRL from 1982 to 2004. After 22 years at the helm, Ian assumed the role of collections librarian for the CBRL. He retired in 2019, 
and its many contributions and positive impacts will be felt by the CBRL's library patrons and staff for years to come. Under Ann's tenure, CBRL was modernized, branches saw an increase to operating hours, a new branch opened in Inganish, the McConnell Library was expanded to include a children's wing, and staff received better pay and benefits. He grew the Nova Scotia collection, which is held at the McConnell Library. So that is considered one of the primary print resources on Nova Scotia's history in the province. All who interacted with Ian in any capacity would agree that his greatest gift as a leader, as an innovator, and as an administrator was his humanity and concern for others. The library staff described Ian as incredibly helpful, humorous, kind, and supportive. He will be dearly remembered and sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Councillor. Very, very hard days, absolutely during COVID to lose such special people in our communities. We can now move along to our first agenda item. That is the approval of the minutes. So there are two sets of minutes we will be looking for approval for. So I need two motions. The, Move, first, Madam Mayor. Oh, first. the first is in regards okay. to special counsel, March 30th, 2021, moved by Councillor Lauren Green. Second. Seconded by Councillor Cyril McDonald. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Uh, second is council meeting minutes from May 18th, 2021. So moved. Second. second. So sorry, who moved that? Was it Eldon? Councillor Parsons. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Parsons. Uh, moved by Council Parsons, seconded. Second. Great, seconded by Councillor Ken Tracy. All those in favor, please signify, or sorry, is there any discussion Question. on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Aye. Oh, was that a contrary or just a delayed sound? Hearing none. Okay, motion's carried. <clears throat> Next, we'll move to item two, approval of the agenda. Uh, I should note <clears throat> that there has been a change to the agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under bylaws and motions, the first reading of the tow truck licensing bylaw um, has been removed from this agenda. So staff can undertake further analysis of additional input received and consultation with stakeholders. So that is now removed from our agenda tonight. Looking for an approval of the agenda as is. I'll move. Moved by Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen, seconded by Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Agenda has been approved. Now we will move to item three on our agenda, proclamations. Item 3.1, Filipino Heritage Month. I look to Deputy Mayor Erlene McMillan, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'll look to speak after um, the motion. Uh, be it therefore resolved that CBRM Mayor Amanda M. McDougall and Council hereby declare the month of June as Filipino Heritage Month in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And I would like to move that. Second. Second. Great. Moved by Deputy Mayor Early McMullen, seconded by Councillor Cyril McDonald. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Whereas the Filipino people have a rich and vibrant history and culture with numerous success stories of Filipino Canadians adding to this country's narrative, and whereas Filipino migration to Canada started in the early 30s in small numbers, with Canada's Filipino community growing from less than a thousand residents to becoming one of the country's largest immigrant demographics in just a few short decades. And whereas June 12th, 2021 is the 123rd Independence Day in the Philippines, and 2021 marks the 72nd anniversary of diplomatic relations between Canada and the Republic, the Canadian government declared June to be Filipino Heritage Month. And whereas the many contributions of Filipinos are continually recognized and greatly appreciated in all facets of our society, government, and the private sector. Thank you. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, any discussion, further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, next, we go to item 3.2, National Indigenous History Month. And I look to Councillor Sarah McDonald, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, be it therefore resolved that CBRM Mayor Amanda M. McDougall and Council hereby declare the month of June as National Indigenous History Month in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, and I so move. Second. Great. Uh, moved by Councillor Cyril McDonald, seconded by Councillor Gordon McDonald. Councillor Cyril McDonald. Hey, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, whereas in June, Canadians celebrate National Indigenous History Month to honor the history, heritage, and diversity of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And whereas it is an opportunity to recognize the incredible strength and growth of present day Indigenous communities. And whereas we all need to play a role in amplifying the voices of Indigenous peoples, dismantling systemic racism, inequalities, and discrimination, and walking the path of reconciliation together. Whereas National Indigenous History Month is a time for learning about, appreciating, and acknowledging the contributions of Indigenous people and how they have helped to shape our communities and our country. And whereas we don't have to go far from home to see the tremendous value our Indigenous people and communities have on our day-to-day -day lives, teaching us their ways and sharing with us their values and beliefs that have helped to build a stronger CBRM. And whereas while celebrations and events may be different this time, I would encourage all residents to take the time to share and learn from stories, traditions, and cultures in new ways that keep us together and connected during these unprecedented times. Thank you. Thank you so kindly, Councillor. Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Lovely, motion is carried. We will now go to item four on our agenda this evening, presentations. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to welcome this evening representatives from PAL Airlines. Uh, we have Stephen Short, who is the sales manager, and Janine Brown, director of business here, to talk about PAL Airlines in our region. Uh, welcome, both of you, so much. Uh, very, very excited for the developments coming here to the CBRM. Very excited to see our airport moving along and busy again. And yeah, PAL is definitely playing a big role in that. So I will hand the virtual stage over to you. Super, thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, firstly, we thank you very much for your time this evening um, and for letting us tell you guys a little bit more about PAL Airlines and who we are as a company um, and to explain a little bit about our expansion plans as a whole uh, and talk to you guys about what we're looking to do over the coming months. We do have a slideshow presentation, and I believe that Mr. Short is going to put that up there right now. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, nice to meet you, and, and thank you for taking a few minutes. I'm just trying to sort out uh, a share screen here, and I don't know if the administrator of the call may have to give me a permission or allow me to do that. Uh, Bear with us one second. Not a problem. Oh, the excitement of municipal government. <laughs> the excitement of Zoom. The I know, excitement right? of Zoom. We, hey, we, we've just, all had this, haven't we? <laughs> awkward silences staring at each other. <laughs> you should be able to do that now if you want to try again. Okay. Uh, let me see. 
<laughs> I'm just looking. It does not allow view, speaker view, full screen. If tell, it's not working. Tell's first flight is delayed, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if it's not working, we all have uh, copies of the presentations electronically and printed. So if you want to just move ahead with so, that, we uh, well, yeah. 100%. So Janine, I'll, uh, I'm just going to, I think you were on the last email that was sent uh, with the PDF. Yeah, for sure. So if everyone uh, is following along with what was sent out previously, I will let you guys know that there are some changes um, that we have since made to the presentation. Uh, so I'll just let you know when we get to that slide, uh, what those changes look like uh, and what's relevant now versus what is not. Um, obviously things are changing quite quite quickly, quite rapidly, um, between all the provinces in terms of travel restrictions. Uh, our team is working to be as flexible and dynamic as possible uh, in reacting to those changes uh, so that we can make sure that we're reacting to market demand. So get into that a little bit more, but I'll let you know who PAL is. So if you're looking at um, slide number two, which is the EIC family of companies, uh, you will be looking at our uh, parent company, which is Exchange Income Corporation based in Winnipeg. They are owners of multiple aerospace and aviation and manufacturing companies. So, of course, PAL is, is one of the, uh, the aviation firms that, uh, that Exchange Income Corporation holds in Canada. They do have over 4,500 employees across North America. And they are one of the top 10 defense and aerospace companies in Canada. Uh, so we're in really fantastic company. We have sister airlines all throughout Canada, in particularly operating in the north uh, with very strong indigenous partnerships. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're very lucky to be able to call on those partnerships when required. Um, and uh, we're a pretty large aviation presence in Canada as the exchange group of companies. Now, if you'd like to move to slide number three, which is the PAL group of companies, I'll let you know a little bit about PAL itself. So PAL Airlines, as you'll see in the chart there, we are a part of the larger PAL group of companies. Um, so we are headquartered in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador, where we've been based for over 35 years. Uh, we did start as a, a regional flight school, um, and that sort of come full circle as we uh, did purchase Moncton uh, Flight College there about three years ago. Uh, so we are uh, proud owners of, uh, of the Flight College now, uh, and that's a really uh, important part of our uh, portfolio as the aviation group of companies. But you'll see there that PAL, PAL Airlines is a part of the PAL group of companies. We are joined, of course, by PAL Aerospace. Uh, PAL Aerospace uh, primarily works in um, aerospace, military defense, and recognizance. Uh, and they do that all over the world for multiple governments. Um, you'll also see that we have an aviation services division who provides fuel and FBO services in both St. John's and Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, as well as MFC training, uh, which is Moncton Flight College. Uh, we're very uh, blessed to have a very diverse company uh, that has certainly come in handy over the last year and a half throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've been able to draw on strengths from each of our business divisions um, and to be able to prop each other up when necessary. So that's been really important for us, particularly uh, throughout the last year and a half. If you were to move to slide number four, a little bit more about who we are um, as PAL Airlines. Uh, so as I said, we are headquartered in St. John's. PAL Airlines has over 45 years of operating experience as a full service regional airline. We offer commercial cargo and charter services. Uh, and we are the Proud, very proud seven-time award winner of the Bombardier On Time Performance Award. So I already spoke about Moncton Flight College, which is one of uh, the companies in our aviation flight services portfolio. Uh, but we also have Air Borealis. Um, Air Borealis is a partnership between us, PAL Airlines, and also between the Inu and the Inuit uh, of Labrador. Uh, so we bring sustainable air transportation to northern Labrador. Um, it helps support uh, the people of the north. We're very, very proud of this partnership. Um, and I've spoken about a PAL Aviation Services. So as I said, we do provide fuel and fixed base operations for charter clients in both St. John's and Halifax. 
And so we are in fact the leading air service provider in Eastern Canada and Quebec. Uh, we've been providing regional air services in Quebec as well for over 25 years now. Um, we have specialized in servicing um, the North, so in specializing in serving natural resource companies, uh, mining companies, uh, large hydroelectric pro projects, um, as well as those traveling for leisure throughout Newfoundland and Labrador and throughout the province of Quebec. Um, and now we're excited to be able to expand upon that, which I'll touch on in just a second. We do specialize in both leisure and corporate, as well as group travel. Um, and our differentiator is 100% our customer yeah. service. This is what PAL is known for. We're known for our on-time performance, as I stated earlier, and our customer service. Our staff go above and beyond for our passengers. Uh, and we're look for, looking forward to bringing uh, a little bit of that customer service uh, to the Maritimes. You move on to slide number seven, you will see our fleet. Uh, so we're very proud to have a robust fleet. Uh, a growing fleet, a quickly growing fleet. Um, we do have, uh, you'll see on the bottom there, those are aircraft that we utilize primarily for uh, charter. Uh, so those are available uh, to rent. Um, so we've got our Citation 10 aircraft, which is beautiful, quick uh, corporate jet. And then you'll see along the top there, this is our primarily our commercial fleet. Uh, certainly they are offered for charter services as well. But what you're gonna see there is you're gonna see our Beach 1900 of which we have two at the moment. You're gonna see our Dash 8100. This is a 37 seat aircraft uh, of which we have two at the moment. We have our Dash 8300. We have, um, we have our 300, we've got seven of those aircraft right now. And our Dash 8400, we have four. We've actually just acquired another one of those aircraft. Um, so we actually were able to acquire all of our Dash 8400, those are, 76 seat aircraft throughout the pandemic. Uh, and we've done that in to help ensure our growth, both for our charter clients uh, and our commercial uh, air services growth as well. So very proud of, of you know, being able to add the, that aircraft type to our fleet. And that's gonna really help with our growth uh, throughout Eastern Canada, certainly. Slide number eight is a beautiful picture of one of the new Q400s. I do want to also mention that we do offer flight services in flight service with flight attendants and lavatories on board all of our aircraft. I also want to mention Pal Airlines commitment to safety. So obviously safety is always our top priority. Um, you know, not only operationally, I mean, of course, that is our top priority, but also from a COVID perspective. So since the start of the pandemic, we put in place um, many uh, safety protocol. Uh, these include reduced touch points, enhanced sanitization. We do aircraft disinfectant fogging regularly of our aircraft. This is a high power disinfecting of every nook and cranny in the aircraft. Um, and we also do temperature checks uh, before boarding the aircraft. So we really have uh, every area of comfort in terms of uh, covered in terms of providing that safety and comfort as it relates to COVID-19. All right, so what we're all here for, our scheduled service. So that's slide number 10. Um, so obviously you're going to see uh, a spider web, right? The route map does definitely look like a spider web at the moment. But basically what we're doing is we're taking our current route network, which operates through Newfoundland and Labrador and then um, and Quebec, and we're connecting both Newfoundland and Labrador with the Maritimes, uh, with connections to New Brunswick, connections to Halifax. And then we're taking the Maritimes itself and connecting into Halifax. Um, so these connections are obviously essential to our route network expansion. These are connections that are required by the market. So basically our goal, um, you know, in building our new schedule, in building these route launches uh, was to be able to develop a schedule that emphasizes building regional connectivity. So obviously throughout the pandemic, there were a lot of changes in the aviation landscape in Canada, certainly Eastern Canada. And we wanted to make sure that we could continue to build connectivity within region. We're a great regional airline. It's what we do best. It's what we have the fleet and the team expertise to be able to do. And so we're looking forward to expanding upon that. This is right in our wheelhouse. Uh, and we know that we have the capacity to be able to do this. So what we've done so far and what we'll continue to do is we'll monitor demand 
uh, to make sure that we're filling those gaps. So we also, um, very exciting, and you guys will see another slide uh, explaining our interline connectivity. We've, we've had an interline agreement with WestJet for the last three years, but we now recently also have an interline agreement with Air Canada that went live just last week. So having this connectivity with our two national carriers, um, these partnerships allow us to be able to bring connectivity throughout Eastern Canada and throughout Quebec um, to larger centers to be able to connect onward. So we're keeping a very close eye on how we can do that, both schedule and capacity. Um, so, you know, constantly monitoring demand, constantly looking at um, travel restrictions and how that's impacting our bookings. Um, so we're keeping a very close eye on that. We want to make sure that when we do launch our Sydney to Halifax service, for example, that the demand is truly there and that we have those folks who are looking to connect onward. Um, that's really where we're going to see the Sydney to Halifax flight in particular be successful. So we're keeping a tight eye to that um, and we'll continue to adjust that schedule accordingly. Um, you'll see a bunch of schedules that have since changed. And so I'm not going to run through those because there's been quite a few changes to times and dates there. Um, but I will let you know that we are still planning to launch our Sydney to Halifax flight this summer. Uh, and we're keeping a close eye to make sure that we have the correct date in mind for that launch. Perfect. So guys, we're going to uh, move forward. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our core services as a, as a company. Uh, Janine sort of touched on it earlier. I'm going to take a little bit of a deeper dive. So we're going to jump to our charter slide, uh, depending on which uh, document you have there, if you can see on my screen here. Um, so one of the things we're well known for, and, and we have, uh, you, you may have seen our, our uh, fleet tails uh, on the ground in Sydney, is uh, we do quite a bit of charter work. Uh, we specialize in crew rotations, we specialize in group movements. Uh, we also specialize, of course, as, as Janine alluded to earlier with executive and, uh, you know, quick hop uh, charters, both uh, nationally, domestically and internationally. Um, so this has been a core part of our business and obviously uh, in the last uh, 18 months has become even more so uh, important as people look for uh, alternative ways to travel and alternative ways to keep, uh, keep their businesses moving and their enterprises moving. So uh, we've, as she mentioned, we've got a flexible fleet, 24-hour uh, service uh, through our FBOs and, uh, and we're always there to serve. So it's been a cornerstone of our business. The other piece that comes along with uh, a little bit more unique with us is uh, we have a robust cargo service throughout our network. Um, we offer three different levels of options, general, express, and priority for same-day shipping um, or next available flight. Uh, we provide reliable cargo service throughout our markets, uh, and it's oftentimes very uh, very convenient if somebody needs a, a you know, hotshot item, a document sent out, uh, all the way up to... We've had, We've had requests to move, uh, uh, you know, large live animals and, and uh, you know, especially our, our pets and our friends, so dogs and cats and, and whatnot is, is very popular uh, lately. So that's our cargo service. Um, this is one of the key uh, foundations of our business and pillars of our business is our community involvement. Uh, you'll often say, see on our marketing collateral, our, our line, helping communities take off. This isn't just a tagline, it's a way we do business. Um, so when we get involved in a community, we want to be a good community partner. We understand the role that reliable air service and committed air service to a region plays. Um, so, and that's done through supporting the community, supporting the not-for-profit, supporting the families, uh, and supporting the enterprises there. So, uh, you know, um, we do well over $150,000 um, in cash and in-kind donations uh, uh, annually. We look at community event sponsorships. Uh, we host family-focused community events, uh, in-kind air travel donations for not-for-profits, in-kind cargo shipment. Uh, another thing we, we truly enjoy is, uh, is, is our pal people. We enjoy to volunteer. We enjoy giving back in our community. Um, it's, it's, it's a a splinter of our customer service, uh, I would call it. It's, uh, you know, people enjoy giving good customer service, also like giving back in their communities and it's it's the pal way. So it's a, it's a big cornerstone of what we do. It's a big cornerstone of how we do business and uh, and we're very proud of that. So the other, other piece here is, uh, as Janine alluded to earlier, we not only specialize in leisure and group travel, but uh, corporate travel is a big part of what we do. Um, 
we've developed our Flex Plus program over the last uh, 35 years, uh, 45 years of operation. Uh, it originally came out of the mining sector, you know, major crew rotations. But what we learned was uh, it works for small and medium business as well. Uh, there's no upfront cost um, for those of you who are interested. So it is a pay as you go. We understand people's business and cash flow is, is important and an organization's cash flow is important. Um, you know, no advanced booking restrictions. Your, your rate is fixed from January 1st to uh, December 31st. Uh, no change fees, no name chase fees. Uh, first bag free. Uh, flights are fully refundable up to 24 hours before. So we don't fool around with credits. Again, cash is king uh, and it's important to, uh, to small, medium and large size business. Um, so certainly for those who may be interested in the community, uh, you can reach out, have a discussion with Janine and I, and we'd, we'd be happy to send you some information. So we're happy to open up the floor for, for, uh, for our time period there. Uh, Janine and I to take, uh, take a few questions uh, if anybody has those. Thank you so kindly. As somebody who has, well, before COVID traveled a lot, you don't hear the lines first bag free very often. So that's lovely. Um, we do have a couple of folks in the speaker's queue right now, so we will begin with Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I really like the line, uh, cash is king. That, <laughs> I like that, especially for Cape Breton. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you guys uh, and thank you at the same time for uh, taking your service to our, to our airport. Uh, just uh, a quick question. When it comes to COVID that you, uh, you mentioned earlier, is Will the testing happen in Halifax for those people that are traveling from Alberta, Toronto, wherever, uh, as they connect to Sydney? And I'm happy to hear that you go to Newfoundland now. So that'll be great for uh, for tourism here, where I have a lot of friends in Newfoundland that work work abroad, and they call it the milk run on how they uh, the logistics of how they have to get around. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. And I'd let, thank you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your question. Um, as it relates to uh, testing at Halifax Airport, um, we certainly would defer to the airport themselves um, on that question and, and, and to the Nova Scotia government. Um, it is my understanding that there is asymptomatic testing that will be happening um, at the airport itself, but that's not something that I have discussed with them at this time. Um, I certainly hope that, uh, that that would be the case and it would make things uh, easy so, you know, for that domestic travel. I know that the Atlantic bubble was announced today and we are certainly hoping, I know for sure in Newfoundland and Labrador, I'm not 100% sure for Nova Scotia, uh, but for Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, for Atlantic Canadians, there will not be um, an isolation or a testing period required uh, starting June the 23rd. So we hope that that is the case that has not been uh, exactly or clearly defined by the Nova, Nova Scotia government today, but we really hope that that is the case. They will be following suit. Um, and that will make travel between the provinces easier as it relates to domestic travel. Um, that would definitely be a question that will be better directed uh, towards the airport. Uh, but we're in support of anything that allows domestic travel to start. Connecting traffic on this flight for us is essential. Um, so connecting onward with our na national carrier partners uh, will be an essential factor for the success of this flight. Uh, and that's why we're keeping such a close eye on opening dates and the dates that you guys would have uh, in terms of a launch date of June the 28th for Sydney, it will likely be delayed. Um, and it's because we need to see a clearer picture and passengers need to see a clearer picture on how to travel domestically. So how to travel outside of the Atlantic bubble uh, is essential for this flight. Um, so, so we're looking forward to those being clearly defined and, and that will help give our passengers confidence uh, to be able to book onward outside of Halifax. Thank you. Thanks kindly. Next week, we have Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. And uh, I'd like Councillor Perouche, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome the uh, uh, pal to CBRM. Um, you know, we see great things happening in uh, Cape Breton. And uh, so uh, welcome aboard, uh, not to... Uh, uh, use your uh, line there, um, but uh, I love your model, and uh, um, I'm sure uh, uh, you, you've made a lot of uh, Cape Bretoners uh, very uh, happy. Uh, none more so than uh, Mike McKinnon out at the, uh, uh, the Sydney Airport, I'm sure. But uh, again, thank you for your uh, confidence in Cape Breton, and I'm sure the, 
uh, I see great things happening with this uh, relationship. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your Thank comment. You. We uh, you. it's been a great support, Mike McKinnon. Uh, it's been fantastic to work with Mike, and uh, I have to say that the community, uh, particularly the business community, uh, has been very welcoming, and the tourism community uh, throughout the Cape Bre Breton region has been very welcoming for us. So, uh, kudos to all of all of those guys uh, on on welcoming us with open arms. And now we just need to get those bookings up there. So we need to get the, to to get everything open and and get people traveling because that's what we're waiting on. We're waiting um, for some bookings on this birding. And so are we, yes, thanks again. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next we have Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. And thank you, pal, for investing in Cape Breton course. Uh, I, I, lo I love the fact about your flex program as far as the business community. I'm sure there's been thoughts about this and relating to flights picking up, but a lot of the business community had that daily flight back and forth, of course. And like anything it comes down to demand and supply, I get that. But it, from your Flex Plus programs, has there been thought given to that daily from a productivity reason, reason getting the Halifax coming back the same day? And the other thing that the, uh, the, the, the airlines were offering, like, like a package, package of several tickets that you can use during an annual basis. So I'm just wondering, of course, from a business perspective, uh, planning out, uh, have, have those things been considered? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I would say that both of those things um, have certainly been considered. So we'll start with the uh, uh, the same day flight uh, connection opportunity from Halifax. We've definitely talked about that. And what we've said for all of our route expansions is that this is our beginning schedule, right? So this is the pandemic schedule that we hope to move past pretty quickly. Um, and, 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 you know, we hope that for all of our route expansions that this is the beginning. Um, you know, I would say that we, we need to see a lot more bookings uh, than we have currently to be able to get to that stage. Uh, but that's definitely the goal to get those sales up there, to get those bookings up there um, and to get people flying. Certainly with regard to the Flex Plus program and getting that package, um, it's something that what we found uh, within our current markets and that could change as we expand certainly. Uh, but what we found is that folks really like not having to put that deposit down. Right, they really like not having to pay us anything up front, and if they don't use this program that we've just uh, explained, the Flex Plus program, um, there's no penalty at the end of the year. So folks really like that. Nothing expires. There's no credits that expire and things like that. Um, so we found that to be successful, and, and companies really like it. Now, if we expand into these new markets and we have a new need for a new product, uh, we've got a great dynamic team and a revenue management team who are able to develop something like that if it becomes a need. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Ken Tracy. Thanks, uh, Madam Mayor. Through you to uh, Stephen and Janine, uh, I just want to thank you both for your presentation and uh, living like five minutes away from our airport. Uh, I sort of miss the, the flights coming over our properties around here and I look forward to exciting times and like Councillor Edwards alluded to, I'm sure Mike is uh, Mike McKinnon is, is is pleased with this too. So again, thanks so much, and I look forward to using your uh, your services. Thank you. We look forward to welcoming you on board, Councillor Tracy. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Councillor Tracy. Next, Councillor Darren Brooksweger. Thank you, and uh, welcome to Cape Breton. It's uh, it's great to see your company has put the confidence in our area and. Uh, I'm hoping people will welcome you with open arms and uh, book as much as they can. We know our airport is in, uh, you know, in a big need of this influx. We get back going and getting, getting people in the air here out of our airport is very important to them. What is your uh, uh, list of price right now to Halifax return, if I can ask? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have some really exciting introductory rates. Um, available right now. Uh, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the introductory rate for Sydney to Halifax is a $79 rate. Okay. I, I believe you're correct. It's either $69, $79, or $99. So it's it's either way. It's an extremely competitive rate uh, between ha between there and Halifax. And uh, hey, whiz, that's that's really cheap. You don't get coffee with that, right? For <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's you get good. you get a bottle of water and a cookie right now. We'll see what COVID allows us to do. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> that, that's a great price. So yeah. so again, the the date. What's the first flight when you leave in Sydney? When's your 
first day. So our first flight uh, previously, Counselor, was scheduled for June the 27th. I believe that was a Halifax to Sydney departure and then the 28th. Um, we are, uh, I'll be transparent with you guys. Uh, and that's why I said that a couple of the slides that you guys have are outdated. We are yeah. looking to delay that a little bit uh, because we want that to line up a little bit better with Nova Scotia's domestic reopening plan. Uh, and to give consumers, our passengers, an opportunity to be able to plan their trips and to be able to book onward. Uh, so like I said, that connecting travel is absolutely essential for us, connecting on with our, our interline partners uh, domestically. So uh, so we are looking at a delay. They're likely looking towards the end of July, but that is not uh, filed in our system yet. And uh, you'll see that come out in the next couple of days. Great news. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. No Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. I was picking around the internet today and found that $69 flight too. And I got really excited. So $69. I know. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next on our speakers list, Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And uh, welcome to our, our meeting and welcome to our community. Uh, very grateful for the time that you've given us this evening. And of course, uh, welcoming your cooperation into our community. Um, just, uh, I guess, maybe if I could get either one of you, or whoever would be appropriate through you, Madam Mayor, to speak to the, the um, agreements that you have in place, the, I think it's references interline agreements. Could you speak a little more on what that exactly means and how that works? Absolutely. So the interline agreements as they exist right now, um, they are set up with both Air Canada and WestJet. Our WestJet one has been ongoing for a long time and the Air Canada one is, is quite new. Uh, last week we went live with that. So that is for uh, domestic travel. So within Canada, it's for transborder travel. So to United States and also for international travel. So the agreement is set up that as the world, the country reopens, uh, that those interline agreements will be available. What that means is that our passengers can book one ticket onward to their destination. So if they're flying, we're, we're you know, we all want to go to Florida, right? So if you want to book from Sydney to Florida, you will have that capacity to book just a single ticket that will take you on onward to WestJet or Air Canada from PAL. Um, so you have the security, first of all, of that one ticket, uh, but then you also don't have to worry about your baggage, right? You check it in at your originating um, destination and it goes all the way to your arrival destination. So that's really beautiful. That's, that's the glory of the interline ticket. Right now that is bookable through your preferred travel agency, uh, but we will be working in uh, the coming months, months, um, to be able to offer that on our website as well. So that it'll be bookable for our website. But right now it is available through, through travel agencies. As far as interline goes, that's always the first step. You do it through, through the travel agencies, you gauge the demand, and then you move on to, um, to website booking. Okay, thank you. Well, as I said, welcome to our community and uh, look forward to the day we can welcome you in person as opposed to on Zoom. So thank you very uh, much. Us as well. Thank you so much, Councillor. Well, thank you, everyone. That's the end of our speakers list. And I just want to give a little shout out. I think it's it's awesome to have um, a new airline come in here, but also an airline who has a good Sydney girl working for you too, Ashlyn Burry. So uh, yeah, I always say Newfoundlanders are, are just our cousins, right? Once we move. So very, Absolutely. very excited. Um, this is the good news. This is the light at the end of the COVID tunnel just starting to really shine through. Um, grateful for your time. I know how busy everybody is, but there will be, uh, yeah, lots and lots of opportunity. And, and I should say too, it was nice to see the PAL Airlines social media post about job postings for Sydney and Fredericton as well. So not only are we reconnecting our communities, but there are um, employment positions available out there too. So just want to put a little plug. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you so listen, much. thank you kindly. So, so grateful for your time. Thank, Thank you, Mary McDonald. Appreciate Thank it. Good okay. folks. <laughs> yeah, great way to start the meeting tonight, folks. Okay, next we're going to move to item five on our agenda, street closing public hearing. Uh, so item 5A, portion of 8th Street, New Waterford, District 11. This is part of the New Waterford Hub Project. Uh, I will look to Sheila Kalanko, please, and thank you, our property manager here, uh, to speak to this. Are you there, Sheila? There, can you hear me? 
Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm going to share our screen before I start. Okay. You can see the screen. Can everybody see the map? Yep, map is up. Okay, perfect. So I'll begin by saying as presented to Council on May 18th, 2021, CBRM received a request on behalf of the Nova Scotia Lands Inc. requesting a formal street closing for portion of 8th Street in Waterford um, is, as it related to the New Waterford Hub Project. The subject area is identified in outlined in red on the map shared on your screen. At that time, Council passed a motion directing staff to begin the process required for the street closing. As previously indicated, staff has had no issues with supporting the applicant's request. Pursuant to the Municipal Government Act, a public hearing is required at which time council will hear those in favor and those opposed to the request before you. I confirm notice was advertised in the Cape Breton Post on June 12th, 2021, and through CBRM social media sites. As a result of the ongoing pandemic, tonight's meeting is closed to in-person public attendance. So comments were welcomed by asking the public to submit their comments either by email or voicemail. I note that at the time I submitted my issue paper to the clerk's office, no comments, complaints or objections were received from the community. However, since that time I've received six emails and one voice message as of 1048 this morning. Three were from individuals opposing the street closure. Three were from residents in favor. And one was a general inquiry related to future traffic flow and parking. Mayor and council were provided copies of the comments prior to tonight's meeting for consideration. My recommendation to council tonight is to pass a motion to officially close that portion of 8th Street as outlined on the map attached to my issue paper and to deem that portion surplus and to be conveyed to the province as part of the transfer of land required for the new Waterford Hub project. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, first on our speakers list, we have Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I understand how some people may have some concerns about this project. However, I've been assured that there will be more than adequate parking in this area. And as shown in the traffic study in front of all council here tonight, uh, there will only be a marginal increase to intersection delay, but roads will still remain at an excellent performance level, a level of service A. As far as I know, there will be the designated parking areas for the school site, healthcare clinic, long-term care facilities, as well as our parking at our gym site to accommodate our recreational facilities. After going through traffic studies, the end result was this was deemed beneficial to the total project. It will increase safety for our students and young athletes using our sports facilities. One resident mentioned concerns over the fire department and how would they had how they would maneuver around this area. The Nawadford Volunteer Fire Department had been involved in these discussions as well, and they are in favor of this of this initiative as well too. I really do feel that closing off this small portion of 8th Street is the best option. For safety reasons alone, I think this is without a doubt the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so we are now looking for a motion on the topic this evening. Councillor, I'll move that you... motion too, please. Thank you, Councillor Darren okay. Oakman. Seconded by Councillor Ken Tracy. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary nay. Thank you kindly, motion is carried. Just wanna say thank you again to Sheila. I know um, holding these public hearings during COVID is no easy task. So I, I applaud you and all the staff members and the council members for being able to reach out to our residents, uh, make sure that their voices and concerns are heard um, and, and continuing to move forward with the democratic process. So uh, well done to all. Next, we'll move to item number six on our agenda. Uh, 6.1 is final approval and public hearings. Item A, request to purchase CBRM land and zoning amendment application case 1081 by Menelik Hall Society. Um, 
first up, uh, actually, I'm going to hand this over to Karen Neville, and then I think we do have a presentation as well. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, a detailed explanation of the request was presented to Council on May 18th, so tonight I'm just going to provide an overview. The Planning and Development Department, along with the Legal Department, received requests from the Melnick Hall Society as it relates to their development located in Whitney Pier. The Society has secured funding to undertake some upgrades and an addition to their building. This will provide the Society increased opportunities to serve the community. As a part of the project, the Society is requesting to acquire CBRM property as well as to amend the zoning on several properties. The map on your screen shows the CBRM properties outlined in blue and the properties subject to the zone amendment are outlined in red. The additional parcels and change of zoning will allow the Society to expand its services to the community. On May 18th, Council passed a motion declaring the properties hatched in green on your screen to be surplus to the needs of the municipality. In accordance with the Municipal Government Act, prior to selling land to a nonprofit for less than market value, Council must first hold a public hearing, which is happening this evening. If the Society is successful in obtaining the requested portions of CBRM property, um, subdivision approval will be required to consolidate the parcels, um, and the newly created parcel will have three separate zone classifications. While all the zone classifications would permit the private club, um, the central business district, court, district zone um, would allow the group more flexibility moving forward. Therefore, they're requesting that the area be rezoned. Part 10 policy 17 of the municipal planning strategy indicates that council may consider a zone amendment to a zone immediately adjacent. In this case, the zone requested, the CBD zone, is immediately adjacent, therefore is in keeping with this policy. Notification of these requests was placed in the May 31st and June 7th editions of the Cape Breton Post. Notice was also mailed out to the assessed property owners in the vicinity of the properties in question, and notice was also placed on the CBRM Facebook page. No comments were received um, in relation to either of these requests. For this application, two motions of council are required. Therefore, there are two recommendations from staff. The first is I recommend that council sell the portions of CBRM property identified on attachment F for the sum of $1 to the Melnick Hall Society. And second, based on part 10, policy 17 of the municipal planning strategy, I recommend that council amend the zoning on the properties identified in attachment E to the central business district zone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I do believe, um, according to our agenda here that we Oh, sugar. Um, we do have Michael Morris in here. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to offer a bit of a presentation before we move forward with the motions? Well, my uh, presentation would be nothing more than uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Mayor and Council, for um, giving us this opportunity to develop uh, our community hall that's been here since 1936, uh, where we hosted countless men, number of events that I hope we'll be able to get, uh, carry on because of this expansion right now with uh, COVID, of course, uh, things have been pretty quiet. And sometimes quiet is good, but it's nice to hear some of the things that are happening in CBRM. And some one of those things will be, we will be uh, reopening and um, hosting a few events here that uh, have been very successful uh, with, uh, with our uh, community. So uh, with this expansion, uh, we will be able to host more uh, people, be a little more um, feasible uh, in operations, uh, and of course, continue the essential need that every community has. And I know our communities are, none of them are really too large. We, we, we thrive on social connections. 
And the Melnick Hall has been doing that since 1936, and I want to see it continue. And what council and yourself, Ms. Madam Mayor, have done is put a lot of um, thrust into this project. The council, um, uh, you're very welcome to come and visit sometime. Keep an eye on us, and uh, we will appreciate, we certainly appreciate the province uh, giving us this, partnering with us uh, to facilitate this expansion. And by your donation of land or sale of land to us, I heard someone say there not too long ago, uh, could we get not get at least a dollar fifty or dollar twenty five? But uh, we will do that as well if if necessary. Um, we want to invite you to be in, in, and we want you to know that this is considered a, a a partnership with yourself, and your contributions will not be. Uh, uh, be in any way, shape, or form, um, unappreciated, and notice and due notice will be given to uh, council uh, for this decision. And thank you to uh, uh, our councillor uh, Lauren Green for uh, assisting us in this matter as well, and and everyone who else has has helped at the board and the community. Thank you, and thank you to Karen and um, Sheila for their much help. And that's all. I don't want to take up any more of your precious time. Thank you very much. We are very, very uh, humbled and honored to have you uh, participate in council here tonight. And I'm excited for those, those days that we can connect in person again as well. Um, so on our speakers list, I will now go to Councillor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Michael is, uh, I've never seen him that modest. Uh, he is a uh, tireless worker at the community hall and uh, Melnick Hall and uh, wasn't for his driving force. I don't know that it would be where it is today. And uh, I want to go on record for thanking, uh, thanking you, Michael, for uh, the work you're doing on behalf of the black community. And it's uh, great to see the, the achievements you've um, attained thus far. What I'd like to do at this time, Madam Mayor, um, as uh, Karen indicated, there's two separate motions that need to be moved. And I'd like to move both of those motions. The first one is I'd recommend council to sell a portion of PID 15547284, PID 15609902, and PID 15609910, and lastly, PID 15609928, identified on attachment F for the sum of $1 to the Melnick Hall Association and ISO Move. Society, okay. sorry. Okay. Great. So that first motion moved by Councillor Lauren Green, seconded by Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Councillor Green, do you want me to go back to you? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the second motion, based on part... 10 of the policy 17 of the municipal planning strategy policy. I recommend council to amend the zoning on PID 15130438, PID 15130446, PID 15130628, PID 15130610, and PID 0636 to Central Business District CBD zone, and I so move. Second. That was moved by Councillor Lauren Green, seconded by Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Co uh, motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Michael, for coming in tonight and participating with our council. Um, we don't like to keep a close eye, but we sure do like participating in fun events. So uh, very excited for the invitations and the progress uh, at the hall for sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council. Here. All right. Now we can move to item 6B, case 1082, rural CBRM and Rural CBRM no mobile home zones. I look to planner Kristen, please. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. 
Um, I do have a short presentation for you this evening. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so you'll find the full staff report on page 44 of your agenda package. And I just want to quickly reiterate um, that the purpose of, of this request is really a housekeeping amendment to ensure the continuity of the special provisions in place for the Sydney Road and Grand Lake Road corridor. Um, so in 2019, there was an amendment where a number of properties fronting along this corridor were rezoned to the rural CBRM or RCB zone. Um, but in carrying out that amendment, staff failed to carry over the access provisions into the RCB zone. So again, the purpose of this amendment is to correct that oversight. Where this is a public hearing, notice was advertised in the Cape Breton Post on May 31st and June 7th, and it was also posted to the CBRM Facebook page. I did receive one inquiry, but no formal public hearing submissions were received. So with that said, my recommendation is to approve the amending bylaw provided in attachment C on page 61 of your package, which again would remove the rural CBRM no mobile home zone from the land use bylaw and would apply the special provision for Grand Lake Road, Sydney Road um, within the rural CBRM zone. And just to clarify again, um, currently there are no properties within the CBRM that are zoned RCBNM. So that zone within the land use bylaw is simply redundant at this point. And with that, um, if anybody has any questions, I'm available to answer them. Okay, thank you, planner. Uh, so looking for a motion. I so and... move that, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Green. Second. Seconded by Councillor Steve Gillespie. Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, planner. Next, we will go to 6.2, approval to advertise. So this is case 1083, request for a three unit apartment at 52 King Street, North Sydney. Uh, again, we'll go back to planner Kristen. Thanks again, Madam Mayor. Uh, again, I have a short presentation, just bring this up. So as the title would lead you to believe, this is a request for a three unit apartment building at 52 King Street in North Sydney, which is outlined in red on the map on your screen. Um, this is a request from Lisa Penny, um, and they're intending to convert an existing two unit dwelling into a three unit apartment. This property is currently zoned residential urban C or RUC, um, and this zone permits single detached dwellings and two unit dwellings only. So a three unit apartment would, would require a zone amendment. The municipal planning strategy does contain several policies that advocate for higher density residential development. And specifically part four policy one allows any requests for higher density residential development to be considered by zone amendment. So the purpose of an amendment is just to ensure that low density residential in the area is adequately protected. And in doing so, there are six criteria listed um, for your consideration. And I'm just gonna really quickly go over with those criteria. Uh, the first is that um, to consider a landscaping plan intending to screen starker components. Um, starker components might include something like um, a large parking area um, or utilities or that sort of thing. And the second criteria is to look at on-site parking and vehicular maneuvering. I'm just going to quickly flip to the map that you'll find on attachment C of your agenda package. So the land use bylaw requires three parking spaces on site for a three unit apartment building. And you'll see that there are two existing spaces provided for the two unit dwelling. The applicant has indicated that they intend to add an additional driveway and parking area to the opposite side of the building to accommodate that third parking space. The third criteria is to look at traffic emanating to and from the site. Um, in this case, the request is for one additional dwelling unit, which 
isn't expected to significantly increase traffic onto King Street. Uh, this criteria is really more applicable to larger scale apartment buildings. The remaining criteria are to look at adverse effects of any significant buildings, uh, to look at aesthetic aspects of the streetscape, and consider adverse effects due to bulk and height of the building. In this case, this is a conversion of an existing dwelling, and there are no additions proposed to the building, so ultimately the exterior would remain unchanged. That being said, the draft zone that I've included in the amending bylaw um, doesn't, excuse me, <laughs> does include provisions which would ensure that if the site is redeveloped in the future, that the scale of any new builds would be compatible with residential development in the area. So next steps for this application, if council wishes to proceed, the next step would of course be to schedule a public hearing. And in keeping with our practices, um, we would then advertise in accordance with Municipal Government Act in the newspaper, as well as mail out to property owners in the vicinity of the site and post to the CBRM Facebook page. So in summary, as discussed in the staff report, um, the proposed amendment is in keeping with part four policy 1.D.9 of the municipal planning strategy. And for that reason, I'm recommending that council proceed to a public hearing and furthermore, um, amend the zoning for the subject property from RUC to residential urban three unit. And I've included a draft amending bylaw that can be found in attachment E for your review. With that, again, I'm available for questions. Madam Mayor, I'll move that we go with staff recommendation. I'll second Thank it. You. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen, seconded by Councillor Gordon McDonald. Uh, discussion on the motion, Councillor or Deputy Mayor, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just very briefly, just in case anyone has any questions. I'm very familiar with the area. I'm actually excited about a, the potential of a new uh, rental property um, with housing as tight as it is in the area. And uh, it's a great street and it has bus, you know, for bus routes and close to shopping. And uh, I think it's fantastic and fingers crossed we get a little more in that area. So thank you. Thank you kindly, Madam Deputy. Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Thank you kindly, planner. Motion is carried. Thank you. Wonderful. Now we are going to move to item seven on our agenda. Uh, 7.1, council meeting May 18th, public report, citizen appointees to various committees. I look to Madam Clerk, Deborah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my report uh, is starts on page uh, 73 in the agenda package. And um, I would note that at the May 18th meeting of council, there was a motion passed approving the recommendations of the nominating committee for the appointment of citizens to various CBRM committees and boards. Uh, and they were subject to their acceptance of the positions and any required background checks. Uh, a copy of that motion is included in the agenda on page 74. And I'm pleased to advise that all successful applicants have accepted their positions and the required background checks are complete and in order. Therefore, I am now providing Council with a public report on the successful candidates as follows. For the Accessibility Advisory Committee, and these appointments are for two years, that Louise Gillis, Douglas Foster, Jenny Rachel Lind, Sarah McPherson, Veronica Merrifield, Dr. Linda Murray, Marcy Shuri Stanley and Elaine Schwartz. And also for the diversity committee, which is a two year term, the gay, lesbian and transgender community is Veronica Merrifield. And this is for council's information only. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank all of the community representatives that put their name forward as volunteers on these committees. It is extremely important and we value your time and dedication to these committees so, so much. Also just wanna put a quick nod out there to our, our clerk who has spent considerable amount of time doing recruiting work uh, for our committees as well. And that is an ongoing effort for our various uh, vacancies. So just, 
thank you all around to everybody for your time on that. Okay, next item 7.2 in our agenda. So this is coming from our in-camera council meeting today, June 15th, 2021. Uh, report per, as per section 22.2E of the Municipal Government Act. Uh, this is in regards to contract negotiations. So we did have our meeting today. Uh, it was with Albert Barbushi in regards to the current development agreement that exists between SHIP and CBRM. Um, I think Councillor Eldon McDonald, did you? Yes, if I, could, if I could, Madam Mayor, I would move a motion if I could. And uh, I have it written down here. I submitted to you uh, shortly after uh, trying to get uh, through from our, our in camera today. Uh, so the motion would read a motion that mayor and council extend the current contract for three years beyond the current end date of the contract as referenced in the terms of the option and development agreement with Sydney Harbor Investment Partners Inc. SHIP and the formation of a CBRM steering committee to assist in the advocacy and work required to move the project forward. Second. So Second. So, yep. great. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Councillor Elda McDonald for moving. Seconded by Councillor Darren Brookschwager, uh, Deputy Mayor Early McMullen to speak on the motion. Madam Mayor, I believe that was from the last one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is I, there I, any? I, oh, go ahead. Is there any discussion on this motion? Actually, if no one's stepping up, I will. Go ahead, Madam Deputy. As long as there's no one that wanted to, to go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, I, I just wanna put it out there for clarity that we do currently have an agreement in place that um, I'll just start from the beginning, I guess. Um, on June 16th of 2015, the initial development agreement was signed. On November 21st of 2017, we amended the agreement with an extension period dated up to including December 19th, 2021 along with the option of two additional 18 month extensions to be utilized at council's discretion if it was required by SHIP on their go forward. I think it will be safe to say that in a global pandemic, um, there, we would have no doubt solidified at the very least the original extension taking us to June, 2023, again, leaving an option of another 18 months, which would carry over to December, 2024, which is the exact amount of time that's being asked for and would be given if we grant and approve this today. I still don't see any reason we as a council should make the decision to overturn a legally binding agreement of a previous council, which was developed in partnership with SHIP, staff, legal, legal council, and was ratified by our council that actually has the allowances to meet the three year ask of today. Like situations like this is why such a clause was put in there and it wasn't done haphazardly. It makes no sense to me and makes me question why we bother developing these agreements in the first place when there is a legal provision already available, why rewrite it? It's my opinion that the responsible step would be to meet the requirements of the current agreement and reevaluate when the time comes, which I believe was the document's original intent as I was there when it was put forward. I'm sure we could easily agree, all of us, without putting words in my colleagues' mouths, that easily 18 months due to COVID alone would be a simple approval. I'm also not comfortable with the idea of a steering committee with particular authorities. It was that type of governance that wasn't met well, but with public opinion and overturned by council of the day. Again, me being one of them. I'd prefer to see our economic development partners like the CB Cape Breton Partnership take on the file so that information can full, flow freely and can report back directly. We do need a point person. It just, I don't believe should be an elected one. I also don't understand another preliminary ask of further extensions, but we can deal with that at another time. I guess my ask of colleagues today is to understand that not all of us are comfortable making decisions based on little to no new information. I understand it's the nature of the beast when it comes to NDAs and global markets, but at this moment, there's absolutely no need to change anything because the legal authority already is there. Like in all seriousness, why would we change it? We already meet the ability to grant the ask only in stages, and this is something both parties agreed to just in 2017. This wasn't that long ago. We have somewhere between eight and $10 million invested in the property. So we have a lot of skin in the game. We know this development can be a game changer for the island. 
but we need to be responsible as we move forward because it is public land. I'm in full support of honoring our current agreement and allowing the first to two 18 month extensions be granted, but I will not support the abandonment of the current agreement, which removes our ability to reevaluate our situation as we move forward. It's possible to be both supportive and responsible with this project and removing your ability to have checks and balances certainly doesn't add to the support I have or probably many members of the community will have with the project. Remember today's vote doesn't change the length of time SHIP has available to them. It only removes the legal authority we have that we signed on for only three and a half years ago with full support and signature of SHIP. So again, it's not about changing the time available. It's about removing our right to check in halfway through. The ability of three year extension already exists with the proper checks and balances in place. We have an obligation as elected officials to be responsible, which is exactly what we did in 2017 with this agreement. Overturning that doesn't sound very responsible to me. And although I'm fully supportive of the development of a container terminal, I will not be supporting any motion that removes the current right of this council when it comes to this file. I'll be upholding the 2017 agreement of staff, council and ship. And if this motion passes, I at least will find solace in the fact that I won't have to answer to these unnecessary changes when the questions do start coming. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Next on the speakers list, Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> How do you follow that? <laughs> but uh, I, as a new councillor, and I have followed this uh, through many, many years, uh, I just have a hard time with the same old talk of what's happened. And as a new councillor, in our in-camera meetings, I haven't received any new information that I couldn't pull off the internet, that I couldn't find in old files. So I just have a hard time myself uh, supporting this where it, it seems like we're like the hamster on the wheel and we just keep going around and around and around. And uh, I asked the question this afternoon and I don't really know if I got the answer. So I'm gonna ask it again here and I don't know who can give me the clarity. Is there any way, and I use the word tangible, is there any way that if we're not happy with how this progress goes in the next uh, the next three years, is there an opto clause for us? Like, is there a way out if we sign this new agreement? Are we just signing our rights away again? How uh, I don't I don't even know who's here if they can uh, if they can answer that question. And just to finish it off, I'm going to uh, quote my late father, who used to <laughs> used to say to me all the time. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I kind of feel that that's, uh, that's where we're headed with, uh, with this file. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I will direct the contractual question to perhaps our solicitor. Okay. Um... What's the particular question? Um, there was a bunch of yeah. things there. Okay, uh, I guess that my main question is, if we're not happy with how this goes with this uh, 18 month and 18 month agreement, and we don't have any tangible results at the end of this three years or before the three years where, it, like I'll use the expression, if you build it, they will come. Do we have an opto clause? Do we have to, can we, can we end the deal and throw this back out to other people after three years, or is it just going to be an extension after extension after an extension until somebody signs on for us to have a port, I guess? Well, what you're doing now is extending the agreement, which ends in 2021 for three years. So after the three years, council will get to look at it again and decide if, you know, if, if there's a request for an extension at that time, uh, you will get to decide it at, at that time. And there's no, you don't have to sign on for another extension at that time, but once you give the three years now, you're committed to that three years. Okay, so is there a way that if, say in two and a half years, we're right back where we are right now, where it's just all words that you can opt out or is it your- No. Okay, all right, thank you. There's no how to. Perfect, thank you. I see Madam Mayor, you'd like to- uh... Um, speak? Yes, so I have left my seat for a moment just to offer my thoughts. Um, I find I find the situation a little bit nostalgic. So I feel like, 
you know, while I sat on council as a counselor, we worked tremendously hard to ensure that we were being what Deputy Mayor McMullen said, both supportive of the project, but responsible of public asset. Um, I personally, uh, you know, we did receive some documentation uh, from the entity to give us an indication that they wanted to extend the contract by three years. Um, I really, I have a hard time letting go of that work that we put into all of the clauses, all of the research, all of the discussion and all of the consensus. That agreement had full consensus of council, which was not an easy task at the time. That agreement that currently exists with the two 18 month extension options um, were there, were put there specifically so that we could maintain um, responsible but arm's length control of what was happening with the public asset. Um, the fact that there was a steering committee kind of put into the realm of all this, um, yeah, in, maybe that is a good idea, but we don't have something in paper on in front of us to analyze, to look at, to research, to say, okay, we're prepared to change the current agreement altogether. Um, I, I, I would like to respect the current agreement that, again, council worked tremendously hard on with all of our partners and all of our stakeholders that still allows three years, but those checks and balances in, in place. So if there was an opportunity to continue while respecting the current agreement, I would be in full support. Again, this is not by any means an uh, indication that I don't support container terminal development. This is great stuff, but when you're working private to municipal government, things need to be a little bit more public uh, when possible. And I think that 18 month check-in is important to allow that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we now go over to Councillor Gordon McDonald and I'll pass the seat back to the mayor. Thanks Deputy Mayor and Madam Mayor. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like, I'd like to have the uh, resolution reread. Um, I thought we were. I thought I was looking at supporting an extension, not a change of conditions. Um, you know, I, I I too believe that there's something in place to, that allows the the extensions to go as requested today. I too am not really in favor of uh, changing what's already been put in place by a previous council by forming a steering committee in this regard. So, uh, I'd like to hear what the wording of that resolution is again, if I could, please. Thanks. Councilor McDonald, did you want to read off your, your motion again? Certainly, yeah. So the motion would be that mayor and council extend the current contract for three years beyond the current end date of the co current contract as referenced in the terms of the option and development agreement with Sydney Harbor Investment Partners, Inc., SHIP, and the formation of a CBRM steering committee to assist in the advocacy and work required to move the project forward. Councillor Gordon McDonald, did you want, you still have time remaining? Did you want to continue? Thanks, uh, Madam Mayor. I, um, so I'm just wondering, like the, the steering committee. So basically, is that if we if we were to go through the steering committee, we're basically um, relinquishing our our, our um, input as council, if you will, uh, if, if we will allow that to go on, uh, that, does that mean that that, that that would go on without council's input and we'd be taking recommendations from the steering committee? Um, and, and I guess, it, it, would that change uh, the dynamics of the contract that's in place right now? And maybe Dimitri may be able to answer that. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Solicitor? The formation of a steering committee wouldn't take away council's ultimate authority. Um, as I understand it, the, the purpose of the steering committee is to have a smaller group uh, liaise, if you will, with, with SHIP. Um, council will still have the ultimate authority with respect to the contract. It doesn't change the contract in, in, in any way. Okay. 
Counselor, does that suffice your questions? You still have some time. Yeah, no, I I don't think so, Mayor. I think um, I, I'm I'm concerned. I, I think we should stick with uh, what's laid out into into the contract and go with the extensions um, as, as laid out in, into the. And I haven't seen that contract, so I'm just going by what you know we're I'm, we're, we're presenting here. So um, if I'm going to sit and wait and listen and see, uh, listen to some other counselors and what they're what they have to offer here and. Uh, um, I'll make chime in again. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Next, we have Councillor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, well, I, I'll, I can tell you that uh, I've got a different feel for the uh, discussion that we had today in camera in terms of uh, the goal forward. Now, um, it's uh, and 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 I and I may stand to be corrected. Um, my understanding is the current agreement does allow for three years as it sits. Um, the only difference is that we have checks and balance in um, in an 18 month to an 18 month intervals, if, that is, if that's what I'm hearing. Um, so we're technically, and I have to agree with the deputy mayor that technically we are simply changing the wording from two 18 month extensions to a blanket three year no old, no old clause, that's what it sounds like. If I'm correct on that, um, yeah, I, I've got a different feel because I think with any agreement that you sign, there's always should be old clauses. And uh, if this ties our hands for three years, well then, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, I misunderstood today's discussion because I didn't think about changing anything other than the 18 month periods to a three year term, um, but we would still have the opportunity whether um, it would be six months, whether it be 18 months, whether it be two years that we could opt out. But if that's not the case, then we're, we're just given the blanket key to the, to the well, we're given the cookie jar, we don't even look, put the lid back on it. Um, so I'm, I'm confused now from the uh, in-camera session that we had today versus what we're discussing here this evening. So if I can get some clarification on that, um, I, you know, it would make it easier for me to, to either support it or not. Um, but uh, my understanding is that we're going from the two 18 month extensions to a blanket three years, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Solicitor? Yes, right now you have an agreement that expires uh, 2021. There's presently two 18 month extensions, the possibility of two 18 month extensions. What the request is today is to basically waive that and give a three-year extension, quite simply. So instead of having 18 months and then another second 18 months, you're giving them a three-year extension at the expiry of the present agreement. Does that provide us with um, opto clause in it or do we have to actually honor the three years? Y yeah. I'm I'm not sure what you're talking about an opto. I mean, you have a contract with them now that has the possibility of an extension, right? Right. After the expiry, you can come, there's an 18 month and a second 18 month. So there's no real opt out other than that. You can extend or not extend. So now they're saying we want a three year extension instead of an 18 and an 18. So they wouldn't have to come back in 18, presuming you gave a first 18. They would, you're giving them a three year extension now. So they just have to follow their terms of the contract. But as far as the term of the contract, it's another three years. So in essence, it, it just, all it's removing is the two 18 month terms saying that it's now going to be three years. Three years, you're giving them the three years now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cyril McDonald. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I think uh, Councillor Green just hit on what I was trying to get a little bit of clarity and wrap my head around uh, 18 and 18 and where I went to school was 36, which is three years. Uh, so I, I'm not, uh, to be frank, I'm not understanding why we're changing the contract if it's the same thing. Uh, I thought I had my mind made up. I thought I knew what I was, uh, knew how I was voting coming into this. Now I'm not sure, uh, perhaps it's a Dimitri question, do we really need to change the contract or 
what's the difference? Is it more, I, I would assume it's more work to change than to just carry on and as is when it's three years or three the, years. The contract is not being changed. The terms of the contract are remaining the same. Right now there's a terms of a contract which ends and they have the possibility of two 18 month extensions. So as it is now, they would have to come back and say, we want an 18 month extension and you say yay or nay. If you granted that 18 month extension, they would have 18 months. And at the end of that, they would have to come back and say, we were looking for another 18 month extension. You would say yay or nay. So yes, they're both three years, but you're giving them a three years so they don't have to come back in 18 months. The terms of the contract remain the same. The terms of the extension remain the same ultimately, but right now it's broken down into two 18 month possible extensions and they're asking for a three year extension. So they do not have to come back in 18 months. Perfect, thank you. I, I'm just, just I making sure what I'm, what I'm hearing and what I'm thinking are the same thing, but it's, it's three years or three years. So, okay, thank you. Councilor Darren Brookschweiger. I don't know uh, where to start. Um, I'm in a different place this evening for sure than where I was today as far as, I don't know if something happened after the afternoon session or not, to be honest, I'm, I'm a whole lot confused here now. Um, anyway, as I see this thing, what we heard from uh, the, the person in the agreement was that he needs certain time frames for the people that he's working with. Okay, that's we all heard that today. Um, we all know the importance of this project. I don't really know what we're doing. I'm really, I'm really at a loss here, and uh, I'm really trying to understand. We know about the ongoing for the past four or five years now. Okay, with with what we were dealing with with NDAs. Non disclosure agreements. Every counselor around the table knew it the last four years. All right. The former mayor had this thing laid over his head like a cowbell to run the program. Nobody wanted to take it from him. Right. So here we are today. We're talking about something. We've heard some good stuff about where this thing stands. And I just, for the sake of me, I really don't know why we are uh, delving in really as close as we are here. Any of these things, as I understand, I got a 30-day out clause. Any of these agreements, is that not, uh, did I not read that in the contract, Dimitri? In the agreement? A 30-day out clause? Yeah, was there not something for 30 days on both sides if there were any major issues that we couldn't leave? I, I'm sure I read that somewhere in that agreement. Well, in the option and development agreement, it, do, it doesn't give you a 30 day. It wasn't there, was it? Okay, no different class. one. We deal with a lot of agreements, but when we've got somebody that's dealing with companies, then he's got six months left on this present agreement. I will not take the chance as a counselor. There's no other deals out there that are in our laps today, not a mayor tribute or a council. Nobody's banging on the doors coming and saying, we want to take this over and get a development. We, our last person we had, it cost us so much money a year to do it until he decided he was going to do it for free. We're not into this anymore for a dime with the current individual that's trying to get a deal. This is a win-win for this community. And I'm very nervous of where we're heading. I'm in full support of Councillor McDonald's a motion for the extended three years. Now, as pointed out, the 18 month clause is there. If somebody is happy just to go with the 18 months and review it again in 18, okay. But seriously, at the end of this, it's my hope that if you're going to support this thing, we're going to be all in on it together. You know, I'd like to see it unanimous, but if it's not, you know, that's too bad because we really got to speak out for this project. And we have to talk to our government partners about the rail. We got a lot to do folks. And I, I'm really hoping this here is a game changer for Cape Breton Island, for Nova Scotia. I'll stop there for now. 
Councillor Steve Parsons. Steve, you're on mute. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm a little bit puzzled like uh, Councillor Bruce Wagger. We held an in-camera session today and the purpose of holding an in-camera session is to ask all the pertinent questions uh, that, that would come to mind during conversations, to talk to the proponent about what he's trying to do. Uh, this is big business. This is not your average uh, million dollar business. This is a billion dollar project. And timelines are very, very important and crucial to development. I'm sure if the ship doesn't have anything within a year or two years in terms of a potential shipper, then there's nothing in for it for him as well and nothing for council. So if there's nothing, nobody coming to our ports to develop it, then the project will die itself. There's no value put to whether we opt out or we, 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 we don't go further in a contract after two or three years. That's our decision after three years. If he needs three years to, to bring this together as we heard today, to actually build out the port is a two and three or four year process. Containers won't hit until potentially 24, 25. So this is timing. So if he goes out to the world and says, I've got an 18 month contract with CBRM versus a longer extension, that may put doubt into a potential shipper's commitment to come to Sydney. And, and what he's looking for is no two 18s is three years. I have no problem with three years. Uh, personally, as I said today, I believe in this project. I support it 150%. I think we should tell the world, in particular, tell our premier, we have an election coming up. This is a topic that we need commitment and support on. And I think, uh, and again, as, as, as was noted today, uh, this, is, this project is big. It can help not only Cape Britain, but Nova Scotia generally. And I'm, I'm scared of where this conversation is going. It's three years for me, it's three years. When we're split up in two 18s, it really doesn't matter to me. I'm, give, I'm willing to give ship the three years to make get someone to commit to bringing containers to Sydney and creating jobs. Thank you. Okay, next we have Councillor Gordon McDonald, followed by Councillor Steve Gillespie. He was just having some problems with the, the request there in the chat. So I just wanted to make sure folks knew. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. This is my second time. If uh, the other councillors would like to speak first before me, if, or. I, I find it just in this virtual world just to keep going through the list so I don't miss anybody, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, for me, uh, I. What I wanted, I wanted to meet you to clarify what he clarified. I think, uh, and then I go, went back to the proposal that was put forward with the request of just to waive the two 18 month extension. So I think initially I got a little bit confused on that. Uh, I think uh, what we discussed today in the in the camera uh, is the stance I will take, and I will be looking at supporting the the resolution put forth by Eldon McDonald, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Um, I do believe that if we're going to take this stance and give the three years, as I said to, earlier today, um, if I'm going to put my support behind this, I'm going to put my full support behind it. I uh, will be watching to see where this uh, extension will go and see how it plays out uh, um, uh, for the residents here in the CBRM and, and for, for the business community and the, that side of it. Um, I, I expect the, my expectations uh, by agreeing to this is that uh, by, by within a year, six to, to 18 months, in the first 18 months, that we'll see some action down in around that area and there'll be uh, some kind of positive reports coming out into the media, to the community and to the stakeholders so that, you know, they will be able to understand the, 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 how, how powerful of, a, of, a, of a, a, a program this could be and a game changer it could be for everybody here in, in, in Cape Breton and certainly probably to a broader extent across our province. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about container terminals for 30 years plus um, because I've been set, preaching it, that for a long time. And, and um, you know, if, if we're here, we, this, this, we've, already, we've already put eight years into it. Uh, I, you know, what, what we have here is, a, is an opportunity to, to give it the one last push, give it one last shove. And uh, uh, I, I certainly want to be, wouldn't want to be the one sitting on the opposite end of that. And uh, have, having, this, <laughs> having said no and, and not given 
uh, this opportunity as we're learning things as new councillors as we're walking into this, we're trying to figure out how the last eight years went and, you know, we had eight years of information with about six months of time to study it. So, um, you know, I, I'm comfortable after what Dimitri said, uh, talking about, you know, uh, that there's no change in the, in the contract. Uh, the CBRM is protected, the residents are protected in, in, in that regard. And uh, I, I, I will be giving this my support. And um, as to the previous councillor talking about, you know, pushing our province, there is an election coming up. And if we're going to make changes here in Cape Breton, it's time for us to push all three governments to all three colours of government. And we know we, we push them all and make them put commitments to get this railroad uh, back into service, to get this container port, you know, pushing ahead. And if and we can get people to see that the province or other 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 uh, political parties are starting to stand up and support this. Maybe maybe our residents will stand up in a swell of support, and we can send a message off to Halifax that you know it's high time that that we we get our share of the pie. So uh, I, I'm going to go with that. Thanks, thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, next, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor McDougall, and my apologies uh, for some reason the uh, computer screen has decided to silence me. Um, but that won't happen tonight. Uh, what I wanted to say was that I am in full support of this project and have been from day one. Um, not only do I believe that we have a great opportunity here, I understand that uh, SHIP has put in uh, countless amounts of dollars and hours in order to get us where we are to this point. Today, we were asked for an extension um, not of time, but of to take out the clause that states that we go 18 months and then come back again and ask for another 18 months. Considering what's happened in the world in the last 16 months and what happened previous to COVID with our relationship with China um, through the Canadian government, I, I believe that there is an opportunity here to, to show SHIP that we are supporting them. And I will support this. The only concern that I have is that um, a liaison committee uh, or board, uh, I, I don't know if that should be written in stone or not. Uh, I, I believe that we need regular updates as it was indicated by you, Mayor, during our meeting. What's most important to the residents and what's most important to us is that we have regular updates from all groups um, that are doing business with us. And if that means that has to come in quarterly, then that's great. If that means a member of council or a member of the community representing council is a part of these negotiations, uh, then that would be fine too. <clears throat> we also learned today, uh, some of us learned, the others uh, were uh, very much aware, that member two has signed on as a, a, um, a partner with Nova Port, not just Nova, not just the other part where the Nova Zone, where all the uh, First Nations communities have signed on to be a part of, but member two has put, as my father would say, cash on the table and is now a full member uh, and partner with uh, a ship. And I think that that is a very important aspect to what we see in council and what the community should see as a go forward. So I'll be supporting this because I want it to continue. And I hope that we come out of this, whether we agree as individual councillors or not, but we come out of this as a council and mayor who are going to advocate strongly for an opportunity to change the future of this island and I agree with what was said in our meeting today that we have to now be the advocates with both federal MPs and all possible MLAs that will be coming in where we know there's going to be election time. Now is the opportunity. And I think that this is our chance to make this happen. I thank Albert Barbucci for his presentation today. And he answered the questions that I wanted. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor James Edwards. 
Thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall. And uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with Councillors uh, Gillespie, uh, uh, Parsons and Brooks Wagger and, and uh, most of the others who were uh, speaking on this. I'm in 100% uh, support of this uh, initiative. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to use my uh, Glace Bay Water Street uh, vernacular, uh, what, what do we have to lose? Uh, th this is a, uh, um, you know, there's been not lots of buzzwords uh, tossed around here in the last uh, uh, 20 minutes or so about game changer and, and so great for Cape Breton Island. They're all true. The, 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 if, if this uh, project uh, takes flight, uh, this is a major uh, uh, initiative that we're looking at here for uh, Cape Breton Island. And to uh, uh, quote uh, uh, Councillor Parsons, we have to tell the world about this. We, we, we don't want to keep this uh, silent. This is a, uh, a great thing. I'm in 100% uh, uh, support and uh, I'm, I'm urging my uh, uh, colleagues to uh, uh, follow suit on that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And uh, I, I agree with the wholeheartedly with the comments made by the councillors that are speaking in, in favor of this. Um, I have a lot of things going through my mind, so I'll, I'll try to be quick and take my five minutes probably. Uh, we spent two and a half days out in Benyon strategic planning sessions. Those two and a half days, what came out of that in the end was that we wanted a prosperous, stable, healthy, vibrant community. Our number one priority was economic development and that's what council wanted to drive forward. And we recognize the port as being that number one opportunity. Well, here we have that opportunity to continue to move that forward and to vote against this, in my opinion, would be voting against everything we, we, we represent and spoke about at our two and a half days in, in Benyon. Um, when we look at, and I'll do respect uh, to the deputy mayor, I don't see that we're overturning or changing a contract. A matter of fact, I mentioned in, in, in my motion that, that this contract would go to the end date of the existing contract, and then we would look at the three-year expansion beyond that. Breaking it down in the two 18-month periods is what was in the contract, and we're looking to just go the, th the three years instead of the two 18s. We've just lost 15 to 16 months and are going to continue to lose more months over the last 15 months with COVID. So any work that could have been achieved in the last year and a half has basically disappeared simply because of COVID and will continue probably maybe to the end of this year. So there may be even further discussions that it may eat into part of the three year uh, extension if this uh, motion is carried tonight. This is about, you know, instead of waiting until the end days as referenced by uh, Deputy Mayor McMullen, December 19th being the end date and then us coming to have this discussion we're having now at that time, this gives partner stability to know now that we are willing to move forward for a three-year period and allow them to work diligently as possible to gain back that last 15, 18, or could be longer because COVID's still with us. So this is about giving that opportunity to win that, that time period back. Uh, and I fully support uh, the, the three months, but this contract will come to its end as we all agreed to, the previous council agreed to. Uh, I, I would I would ask that we do get clarity uh, uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to our solicitor uh, that I do believe, as, as Councillor Brookswagger has acknowledged, that there is an opt-out clause. I believe if, 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 if SHIP does not perform up to uh, Council's liking or we don't perform uh, or uh, uphold our end of the agreement, there is options for both parties to, to end this agreement, I believe. Uh, so I would like clarity brought back in the future on that. So uh, I just put that out to, to our solicitor for, for that for future. Um, the, the steering committee for me uh, has been referenced earlier. Uh, uh, previous mayor uh, was the lead on this file. That was council's choice to, to go in that direction. Uh, Madam Mayor, you have acknowledged through, I know, uh, radio interviews that this is council's file now. Uh, and I believe that council has to move forward in leadership and be part of SHIP in regards to promoting, advocating, and moving this project forward. We have to be leaders in our community uh, and we have to step up to do that. And I think a steering committee will uh, assist in that role uh, and, and make no secrets about it. I would like to be part of that steering committee. Uh, when we look at, um, and I just wrote some notes down here, um, you know, the, the issue of, of uh, I guess the, the 18 months versus the three years, uh, it's simply, 
looking at giving the opportunity of the last time and making that up uh, to, to, uh, to allow Albert and them to continue the, their work. Um, uh, right now, I guess uh, I'll probably leave it at that. Uh, we need to, to, to uh, work forward with SHIP uh, as mentioned earlier uh, by some of the uh, council, co my co council colleagues, you know, we need to meet with provincial and federal representatives and, and organizations and, and, and partners in this to move this file forward. We hear about rail. We need to move that rail forward. We, we need to have sit down and have some serious straightforward discussions with provincial and federal levels uh, and the various different partners to, to try to move this forward. I think personally, my own opinion is we owe this to our community, to everything we can to help change the economic future uh, of our next generation. This is an opportunity to do that. So I'll leave it at that. I may come back a second time, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, on your second opportunity, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Uh, thank you, Marin. I guess I, I just, uh, I'm a little, a little more <laughs> calm right now. Um, I guess for me, again, like Eldon in a way, it's probably something that I'd be interested in sitting on as that kind of a committee, but not a chance unless there's full council support uh, moving forward. I'm not gonna be a target. I watched it in the past and uh, unless we got, haven't got full uh, group uh, support of this here project and the importance of it for our economy, for the future of this island, I wouldn't even dream of it. I, I'm even thinking more like where Arlene was, and I've talked about this before. If council aren't willing to agree with the fact the way business world works with NDAs, we shouldn't be in here. We got to give it to somebody else to run the file because, you know, if we're not there and, and realize the importance of this, I'd say we should uh, really think about that as a possibility. Um, with that said, Madam Mayor, we have one employee and it's our CAO who's paid handsomely to do a job. And I'd ask her if, uh, for her opinion on where we are today, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Madam CAO. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I guess I feel that the, the council are all in agreement that we want to extend this, prod, this um, agreement, whether it be 18 months um, or three years. So I guess that really is the quick question. Um, I think on a go forward, um, council has to agree that they have to all be behind this project and we all have to work together with the province, um, with SHIP to move this project forward. Um, I do agree that COVID was a big influence on this particular piece of work that in this environment, it's extremely hard, uh, difficult to do business so uh, I believe that it would be fair to extend the extra 18 months because of COVID, just, just because of COVID alone, um, because that was the intent of the original agreement and giving them the ex extra 18 months really is not giving them extra because they really could not do business at that time. So I, I would agree with the three years. Um, but again, if we're going to extend it, I believe that everybody needs to be behind it. Uh, if we're not, it's the, not in our best interest, we're not going to get behind the project. Thank you, Madam CAO. Uh, just a quick note, I, I don't think this was a malicious comment, but someone being paid handsomely could be construed as something um, probably a little bit negative. I know all of our staff salaries are noted publicly. Uh, Councillor Brookschweiger, we know people work very hard for their salaries. So we'll just watch our comments, please. Uh, they cer next. They certainly do, Madam Mayor. They, they work hard for Indeed. their money. Thank you. Yes. Next on the speakers list, Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess for me, it, for this situation, it's kind of like six on one hand, uh, half a dozen on the other. Um, two 18 months uh, extensions or 36 months. Why will we do it in 36 months? Uh, to me, it's obvious. It, it makes it e easier for ship going ahead to secure future partners. Like Albert mentioned, uh, when I have a tentative contract in, in place, it, it's pretty hard to secure you know, long-term partners. I, I feel that uh, by granting the 36 month extension, we as a council will be showing our full endorsement to ship. Three years is not a long time. Like uh, Councillor Gillespie mentioned, uh, they have a lot of time and money invested in this project. 
And for that reason, I will see, we'll, we'll be supporting the 30, the 36 month extensions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on the speakers list, Councillor Glenn Perush on your second opportunity. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you everyone for the this delightful debate here. It's always fun. Uh, I do support a container terminal and I don't think there's a counselor sitting around this table, male or female that doesn't, but my personal preference is 18 months. You hold someone accountable, they can check in, show me something. There's words and I get that. I get that Darren, uh, Steve and everyone, you guys have been sitting here a lot longer than I have, but you got six months right now till it runs out. Then you have an additional 18 months. That's two years. Show me something. I just have a hard time with throwing all the eggs in one basket. And then you report back in three years and it's going to be, where's the rail? Where's our navigational aids? Where's this? It's the same story for the last eight years. So I support a container terminal. Do not support this contract. I think it's time we start holding people a little more accountable and we start checking in, start checking in every two months. Tell us what you did, show us something. That's that's where I'm at. So I support a container terminal, but I do not support this, uh, this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Ken Tracy. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, for me, it just seems like a little bit of a rerun from this afternoon. Uh, again, uh, I'm just going to put it out there that I fully support this motion, fully support the project. Uh, I believe strongly and firmly that everybody needs to get behind this, although I respect everybody's opinions. But uh, moving forward, uh, this this is a no brainer for me. Uh, you know, K. Breton in general and the economy, I said, I, I really believe it's, it's going to flourish. Um, three years down the road, who knows what's going to happen three years down the road. Are we going to be back here banging our fists on the table again? So what, where's the railroad? Where's this? Where's that? I'm not so sure. I'm an optimistic guy, and, and I like to believe in three years down the road, uh, we'll be a lot further ahead. So again, I support this, uh, this motion. And uh, again, I look forward to uh, hopefully everybody uh, jumping on board with it as well. Thanks, Mayor. I see Madam Mayor, you want to ask a question. So I will take over and Madam Mayor. Thank you, this is my second opportunity. Um, yes, so I'm glad that the disclosure and, and this was made publicly uh, a number, I think almost a year and a bit ago, um, that member two is involved in, in, this, in this project as an equity partner. Um, that is the one thing I'm not going to lie, that, that gives me hope. We've seen what member two is capable of, do, of doing in terms of the Clearwater uh, Agreement. That's, a, that's billions of dollars into our fishing industry. That is the only thing that is giving me any confidence that this project is going to move forward, quite frankly. Um, when we talk about communication, when we talk about steering committees, I was on council for the past four years and it, we had to fight tooth and nail to get communication, even to set up the meetings recently now with me being mayor, um, it was not a simple task. That makes me very nervous. When you are working private business to municipality, you are accountable to many more people. It's not like working private business to private business. Um, that communication is imperative to making sure that there's confidence in the project. Again, the only reason I will support today is because of member two being involved in the transparency and the business acumen that they do have and the proven track record of bringing home any type of deal. I also want to end on this note, putting counselor against counselor, mayor against counselor saying, if we're not all on board, I'm not happy. We all have to be on the same page. That's not democracy. The reason that we're all around this table is because we all have opinions and those are all to be valued. I, I just, I don't like that, that pushing of one another. Um, again, grateful member two is involved. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we'll go on on their second go, Councillor Green, and I'll put it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor and Madam Mayor. Um, let me go on record here. Um, 
I fully support the container port, port, and I fully support the motion that's been put on the floor this evening. I don't question whether we should have a steering committee. Um, when I look at the structure of council and our committees are all made up of committees, we do not have committee of the whole for any of our committees, whether it be um, fire and protection, police, library, and I can go on. So I have no issue with having a, a steering committee report back to council. Um, member two being in there does obviously offer it some support, but it's not the only reason that I would support it. The only reason I would support this is for CBRM, the economy of CBRM and the future of our children, our grandchildren and their children. Um, if we're gonna move this forward, then yes, we have. it would be nice if we were unified as one voice, but if we're not, uh, majority will rule and I will go with the majority and I will be supporting this motion fully and endorsing the three years and moving this project forward. I don't say if, I say when, and that's what we need to keep in mind is when, and, and we will get it as a team um, for the residents of CBRM. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, next on the speakers list, Councillor Cyril McDonald on your second opportunity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will uh, think I'll be brief. Uh, I, I just, uh, I guess I'll, I'll just say it. I'm going to support this motion. And, and although, uh, um, you know, it's no secret to my colleagues that, uh, that I have lots of issues with this. Um, the rail line is a bone of contention for me, and I'll say it any opportunity that I can. And uh, I hope that this project um, rectifies some of the issues for many of my residents along Route 223 uh, and many other areas of the district where rail line just happens to cross through uh, perhaps two parcels of land that they own. Uh, I hope that this project comes to fruition. I hope that uh, my kids and my kids' kids and their kids will see this on and on and on for years to come. I hope that this brings the economy back to where it was uh, back in the coal mining days and the days of the steel plant. And I hope that this is the boom that our island needs and so so desperately needs. And uh, I'm still a skeptic um, and uh, I will support this. And I think what's what's important to, to note is uh, whether we all agree or disagree, whatever decision is made tonight, uh, we all need to live with it and we all need to carry on with it. And um, that's, you know, we may not all agree, but uh, tomorrow that's the decision that was made and uh, that's how we proceed. So, um, you know, everybody's opinions are, are well heard and valid. And uh, I'll, I'll quote my buddy, James Edwards, uh, you know, I'm enjoying the debate tonight. And this is, uh, I really, I really am. And this is, uh, it makes me think and makes me think more critically. And uh, But at the end of the day, the decision, the majority wins. And I really hope that everybody gets on board and and uh, and carries forward. And you all know how I feel about the rail line. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. We'll get you a t-shirt, Cyril. Okay, next comment, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Uh, thank you, Mayor McDougall. Um, it was uh, only a, a couple of meetings ago where uh, I was the uh, the only nay on a on a uh, on something that was brought to council, and I I didn't change my mind. I, I still disagreed with uh, that project, and everybody else on council agreed. Uh, that's what makes council. We're all here. We're all different people with different points of view. And we all see things much differently. And that is why 13 members of the community are elected and asked to act on behalf of the individuals they represent in their districts, as well as CBRM as a whole. And as James Edwards does say, he loves to see the debate. Well, I'll tell you folks, I respect every single person around this table and I do love uh, to get into it with, uh, with you as well. So keep in mind that uh, if I have said something that uh, uh, may have been uh, uh, taken the wrong way, my sincerest apologies. But this is a council that is focused on this community. And I want to make sure that people that are listening tonight know that. So thank you. Thank you. Next, Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
And I just, I guess I'm just frustrated because, because it seems that if you take a stance against what the proprietor is asking for, when in all reality, it's a time thing, it's about a check-in, then all, all eyes go to, well, if you're not in support of the project and we need to be unified. And I never said I wasn't in support. I was in full support of this first agreement. I'm in full support now of following this agreement. If this was today asking about the 18 month extension that's currently in the agreement to start December 19th, the answer would easily be yes. We don't have to wait till December 19th to say, and as Councillor Perouche pointed out, that's actually two years from now. And I'm sorry, but I, I too know the, the significant the significance of this project but whether we check in in 18 months, it's right in the agreement that as long as the project is moving forward, it's our obligation as council to continue to extend it. That's that's what we put together three and a half years ago. And why, if I don't support three full years without one check-in in the middle, that I'm not able to support or champion it or that I'm not on the same page tomorrow, no matter how this vote goes through, I'm totally going to be in support of the project. I want CBRM to have the involvement that we fought very, very hard for. This is one 18 month check-in. If, if the issue is about that, oh no, if we check in in 18 months, that'll destroy the project. Well, I'm sorry guys and gals, we've got bigger problems. Like, and it's deja vu. I can, counselors that have been here before or go back and watch, it's the same thing. Do it, do it. You have to, you have to. That's a bunch of malarkey. And another thing is the liaison committee is part of the motion. I've heard a few counselors say they were a little worried about that. So you might want to think about that when you vote as well. It's not cut and dry. It's simply give them the three years, but we still get that 18 month check it. Show us you're doing your work. You'll get your other 18. Why remove it? What is the point? What's the logic? And I can't say to my residents that, well, you know, how, how do I support that? How? Thank you. Sorry, that's your time, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Eldon McDonald on your second opportunity. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. I'll just uh, mention a couple of things, I guess, just in, in reference to uh, Deputy Mayor McMullen's comments. I, I guess I look at it as stability. Um, to me, uh, to just give them the 18 months to have a three year stability uh, for them to go speak to global partners around the world uh, once we're past this COVID, uh, it gives them an opportunity to be able to, to show that council has endorsed stability into the project. Uh, if they go with stability for the next six months and then maybe 18 months after that and then maybe 18 months after that the global partners around the world need to know that we're there now and to give them the three years after losing a year and a half i'll say uh that that stability i think is warranted and needed to make sure that the partners are comfortable in continuing with their discussions um check in for me uh you know the, the steering committee i would i would ex be expecting a, a lot more check-ins than 18 months uh, I would expect a lot more check-ins within 12 months, let alone 18. So I don't, I don't uh, expect anything in regards to a steering committee being formed and only checking in once in 18 months. I will expect much more than that uh, from the steering committee. Um, and uh, in regards to the vote, you know, respect everyone's opinion. I would love to see that it would be a unanimous decision, but I respect everyone's opinion around the table on how we vote. Uh, I would say this though, when we vote, if this motion is carried and we move forward as a majority, then all of council should be supporting the direction of council. We should, we should vote and when the vote's taken, whatever the result of that vote is, we as a council as one support that direction moving forward. So I'd leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Councillor Steve Parsons on your second opportunity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This will be my last time I'll speak on the issue. I support it, as I've indicated several meetings ago, 150%. Uh, as far as check-ins, my, my observation was that there was certainly a commitment going forward that check-ins would be more frequent. I trust that. Uh, it's up to us to ask for that check-in, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, but this is going to be an ongoing communications in a new direction with a new council. And, and I think uh, we're on the right track. I think if we unanimously support this, we're sending the right message to all the politicians, be it federal, provincial, and it lines us up. We're telling everybody, and I'll say it, we're telling the world again, that we're all lined up, we support it, we're all the one, and now we're gonna go out and talk it up, speak to the politicians, get support for it, and take advantage of what's out there as far as world trade. Thank you. 
Okay, any further discussion on this motion? Question. Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Nay. Okay, we're just gonna go through the voters list really quick. Um, Councilor Gordon McDonald. Yay. Deputy Mayor McMullen. No. Councilor Cyril McDonald. Yes. Councilor Gillespie. Yes. Councilor Eldon McDonald. Yes. Councilor Perouche. No. Councilor Parsons. Yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Tracy. Yes. Councilor Brookswagger. Yes. Councilor O'Quinn. Yes. Councilor Green. Councilor Green. I think that's a yes. 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 There you are. Great. And myself, Mayor McDougall, yes. Motion is carried to go forward with a three year extension. Good job, Council. You know, I don't even know where I put all my my sheets. That was a long speakers list. Okay, on to item eight, Councillor agenda requests. Item 8.1, Bail Ard Trail Flood Mitigation Project. Uh, I look to Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and we'll jump right into it and we'll keep the debate going, I guess. Uh, I know some of you may be wondering why I brought this to council and uh, it's been uh, it's been a few years since the original decision was made with uh, with regards to the Bel Air Trail and the uh, flood mitigation. Uh, since that time from 2016 till now, I, I think everyone can agree that the perceptions have changed around the CVRM when it comes to how people, how they act, how they go about their day to day in 2016 and even up to 2018, I think people were kind of living in a hysteria and under the impression that we have to do something. We have to do something to save the homes that are flooding. I know there's homes that have sub pumps, uh, sub pumps, mold, there's basements. I'm sure some of the counselors in this, in this uh, virtual meeting here tonight, their basements, you have things on milk crates, so be it, whatever your basement floods. I know half of my, uh, Half of my district, I call it the fishbowl, right? Uh, but in saying that, I know the previous council thought that maybe option 15 was the best, but since then, since the 2018 meeting with, uh, with uh, Alexander Wilson, when he made his presentation, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use uh, Councillor Steve Gillespie because I've watched, this, uh, I've watched this meeting many, many times. When it comes to, he asked the question, is this gonna fix the problem? And the unequivocal answer from the engineering department was no, it's not. One of the options in this was let's do nothing. And I know that there's lots of people out there and everyone's heard it, we gotta do something. Well, I agree we gotta do something, but I don't think destroying a century old forest is the answer. We have to be able to look at this flood mitigation and revamp it and I want this council to be the ones uh, to be able to do it. The Bel Air Trail has over 250 plus members that belong to the group. And as you all know, they've reached out to you in the last couple of weeks. The, the, the message that I was saying to them was, it's time to stop, start bombarding the other counselors with the same messages that you're sending me. And maybe we can revisit this, get it on board and see where it can go. So before I go any further, I got notes here where I could probably talk half the night, but uh, I want to I want to read my motion because uh, Mayor, I don't know what uh, what kind of time I have left. So uh, my motion is requesting staff to prepare an issue paper on the progress of the Bel Air Trail flood mitigation project and update on what benefits and impacts are expected to be affected in the areas as well as to request all movement forwards in the next phase be paused until an issue paper comes back to Council for further discussion with additional considerations. So, Second. <laughs> I wasn't even finished. <laughs> I, like, I like it. Uh, the stakeholders, stake, the stake, 
holders of the community are not happy with this phase. Uh, many community members have pleaded with the CVRM council to recognize the social value of the trail, also considering the broader community of the Washbrook. Uh, a few years have passed since the decision has been made and it's time for us to, uh, to review and discuss the impacts on the ecosystem and what benefit they are gonna have going forward and what benefit we have, uh, have up to date. So I'm hoping that this, uh, this current council can, uh, can make the, the, future, the future considerations of what, uh, of what we're going to do moving forward. And uh, I hope I can garner everyone's support here tonight. I so move. So that motion was moved by Glenn Peru, Councillor Glenn Perouche, seconded by Councillor Cyril McDonald, uh, to request an issue paper from staff in regards to the project, uh, the flood mitigation projects, and cease all uh, project work in the interim. Is that correct? Did I did I, did I paraphrase that correctly? Yes, I know I'm pretty good at long uh, winded responses. So yes, that was good. Thank you. Detail is incredibly important, Councillor. Uh, so we do have a very full speakers list already. That means there's lots of passion here. Uh, we will start with Councillor Cyril McDonald. I will then leave my seat very quickly to speak as well after him. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I woke up one Saturday morning to about 15 emails in my inbox and every subject line was Bel Air Trails, Bel Air Trails, Save the Trails, Bel Air Trails, Save the Trails. And I very quickly tuned into CBC to see if I'd missed something. Uh, I slept past six o'clock Friday morning, so I missed Steve Sutherland, and I thought I must have missed something. I uh, started reading into this a little more, spoke to my colleague, uh, Councillor Perouche, and um, then recalled this, uh, this meeting a couple of years ago to discuss the, uh, the berms that would be uh, erected in the middle of the trails. Um, this group is a group of passion and uh, a, a group of persistence and the emails kept coming and they've kept coming and they've kept coming and uh, as early as uh, an hour ago I received an email from another concerned resident and these are residents of my district that uh, don't even live near the Bellard trails but uh, are, are passionate and use them and uh, I myself as a as a runner have spent uh, many days running through those trails and you know uh, uh, it's a place that uh, many go to for many different reasons and it's far more than just going for a walk or taking the dog out or going for a run there's uh, all kinds of um, all kinds of reasons uh, so for that to uh, to to essentially destroy the trails with something that um, as uh, Councillor Gillespie asked a few years ago will this fix the problem and basically the answer was no why would we destroy the trails um, if it's not going to fix the problem I could see if this was the, the solution uh, perhaps then we could uh, you know we could come up with a with a, a way to make this work but uh, to, to destroy the beauty of, of the Bellar Trails, uh, to destroy somewhere that is used by hundreds of residents, uh, I think is, is not, uh, not right, not proper. Um, and I'm fully supportive of this. And I think that uh, this needs to be stopped. And, and if it's not going to fix it, if it ain't fixed, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Madam Mayor. I bet you guys are surprised I'm gonna talk about trees. Um, so the Baylard, I, I, I don't hide my love for that urban forest um, at all. That forest to me has very special personal meaning. Um, that is where I chose to tell everybody I was running for mayor. That is where my partner asked me to marry him because he knows how much I love that forest. Um, but really the crux of this love for that forest is because of the function. Um, I had the great privilege of working alongside ecologists uh, at ACAP Cape Breton who taught me not only how to value nature for, what, for its beauty, for its healing purposes, but also for its function. Um, what that Baylard forest does right now is much more mightier than any man-made intervention. The way that the water can be absorbed by the roots of these very, very old trees and slow 
back into nature, no man-made uh, intervention could ever replicate. We have something so special in the middle of a city. And I know how special it is because when I, when I do have the opportunity to travel on behalf of council and, and go to conferences and speak to people who live in really asphalt heavy, gray, brown areas, they say things like, my gosh, I wish we had trees. I wish we had the vegetation to cool us down, to help us deal with flood, to help us deal with the effects of climate change, but you can't rebuild that. Once it's gone, it is always gone. You cannot replicate the biodiversity that happens there. You can't replicate the function of what happens there. Um, and I, I just, I do want to make a comment about the intense and passionate work on behalf of our staff here at the CBRM as well. While I was at ACAP, you know, taking my counselor half, hat off and, and making sure that I'm, I'm protecting the natural environment, I saw the, Im, the beautiful work being done by Director Wayne McDonald, uh, Matt Viva. They care deeply about our community too and wanna to make sure that they're doing good work. The work that did take place at Mud Lake that we need to recognize that that has helped and alleviated some of the water issues that, that we do see in, in the downtown area. Um, I, I don't wanna discount the possibility of continuing with the Gill Homes like portion of this project, but really in my heart of hearts and in my brain, I, I know taking away the function of that forest as it stands naturally is going to cause more detrimental effect than it will have any good. Um, Again, much gratitude to all of the staff time that's been put into this and also to all of the people out there who have reached out to council and shared your opinion. Um, we need to hear that opinion and we need to be able to take that opinion and have it here in the council setting as well to help us guide our decisions. Um, I am 100% behind you, Councillor Perouche. Um, really, you said it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it and you cannot fix nature once you destroy it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And we'll now go to Councillor Gordon McDonald and I'll give the chair back to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all the residents that sent emails into my inbox and flooded me with information regarding the Bay Air Trail. And I really appreciate the input that and the information that you've passed on to me as someone who's who knew about the Bel Air Trail? Haven't been down through it, um, but uh, but I'm, I've gotten to know much more about it over the last number of days. Um, I will be supporting uh, uh, Councillor Perusha's motion uh, to look into this because, as uh, as um, the mayor pointed out, you know, uh, uh, to have an urban forest in the center of a city is a uh, is a one of you don't see these kind of uh, things very often, and uh, you know I, I think it's important that. Uh, that this, that this area is protected in full. <laughs> and I believe from what I was reading, there's about seven acres of land that would be destroyed of that forest if they were bringing in the excavators and dozers to do what they're planning on doing or looking at doing. And uh, you know, that footprint will never be erased. It, it, you can't take that footprint and, and, wait, and just make it go away. Uh, it would destroy too much of that area. And, and I believe there's gotta be other options available uh, to, the, to, to the CBRM or to the engineers as to how best to alleviate the flood conditions down further down from that forest. Um, so, so for me, uh, I, I think it's very important that this is saved and I believe that uh, every resident in that area should have done what they needed to do. They brought it to this to the attention of, of, of us as counselor. I believe when all this um, fuss became uh, paramount was during the 2016 floods, uh, and, you know, it was an anomaly of weather, weather you can't stop. Um, you know, things happen and, and uh, I agree with, uh, you know, trees absorb water and the rooting systems take, you know, take care of it. So um, with, with everything you have, uh, I, again, I commend the, the residents and the people that sent uh, emails off to us. And, um, you know, I, I will be supporting uh, uh, Councillor Bruce's motion and to protect this forest. And I think it should be protected at all costs. Thanks. 
Thank you, Councillor. Uh, before we go to Deputy Mayor Early McMullen, I do want to allow uh, Director Wayne McDonald uh, some comment, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a, a, a clarification. Um, I know the motion uh, identifies a pause to the project. Certainly, whatever council decides, uh, staff will follow. Um, we are at a, uh, a time frame uh, currently where we're awaiting regulatory requirements and regulatory approvals. We expect those to come in in August, and no construction will take place until um, later on in August. So that provides a timeline. I did speak with staff uh, knowing this was coming up today, how quickly we could get back to council. So our intent would be, depending on council's uh, uh, vote tonight uh, that we would come back as quickly as possible and communicate the benefits, the pros and the cons of the project. Certainly there are, are, are items out in social media suggesting there's no benefit at all. There is a benefit, um, but council will have to decide whether that benefit uh, outweighs the, um, um, you, you know, the outcomes of, of the project and the construction. Thank you, director. Uh, next we have Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I just wanted to, when this was first discussed, I had the privilege of being invited out for a tour. And it was the first time I've ever walked through the Bel Air Trail. And I was guided by two wonderful, knowledgeable guides. And for those of you that have not had the opportunity to go there, I really suggest that you do. You don't have to walk the whole trail. You can go five minutes in, 10 minutes in, go take a look. It's, it's, it's an, it's a different type of growth. It, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. And, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, that said, back when that decision was made, um, I do want to thank both staff and the Bel Air Trail group um, because they did work together. They were trying to find compromises and things like that. It wasn't an, an all or nothing. There was some teamwork, a little rocket speeding, but it, it worked out. I think the biggest thing here is COVID. COVID has really changed the way people around here have been living and people have been leaving and looking for places for hikes and it's getting more exposure and used more and more often over the past year or two. And I think that is really renewing everybody's interest because I will tell you, I've received more concern over this now than I did when the project was originally spoke about with council. I did not get nearly and I, got a, I thought it was a lot of, you know, correspondence, emails, messengers, phone calls, but nothing compared to the concern that is there now. Um, I, I, I've said numerous times, well, we, we love to say, well, Halifax, well, Halifax. So I'm going to do that right now, Point Pleasant Park. Halifax isn't putting bulldozers through there. And there's a very good reason for it. We possibly have a very good little gem there. Like, well, not possibly we do, but we really... I'm looking forward to staff coming back because I do want to hear the pros and cons. I do want to hear what the options are, but like fellow counselors, and I'll be supporting this, I don't want to touch a leaf or a branch unless it's absolutely positively necessary and can prove that it will be obviously an improvement, a, ma a major improvement, because we have to decide here what we're going to do. What are we going to prioritize? Are we going to prioritize centuries old growth that we know we will never get back species of plants drainage all those things that come with this for is it one house is it two are we going to save any houses are we going to save any streets is it financially feasible that perhaps maybe it's you know like we really really have to closely look to see what we're giving up for what it's saving because like they say god is not making any more of it and if we destroy it we have to, we'll hold that. We will be the reason. So it's it's really a conscious thing. And uh, I really appreciate Councillor Perouche for bringing this forward because it does need another look. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Uh, next, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I guess for me, uh, one of the original old boys club, I guess, from back in the 90s, uh, Myself and uh, Glenn's father, Ray, were close friends and uh, colleagues. And I remember Ray in the late 90s bringing the Baylor trails forward because of the flooding conditions. And I was stressed he was at the fact of people's basements, water just continuously running through them. You know, he talked about, you know, the different issues and he was visiting homes. And that was the way Ray was. He went out and he seen it firsthand. 
and he had a genuine concern about mold and all the, he talked about it, you know, how it stick in the basement. So to understand the stress relief of walking the Baylor trails, well, think about the stress of those people that are living in those homes. And let me start here by saying, I'm going to support the motion, Glenn, that you put forward. Um, but make no mistake, we've been trying to find an answer to this problem. And I know Wayne McDonald has been working with that committee for years, for years. We've worked with Dave Gabriel as a council since I started to help with projects to build the Baylor Trail. Our staff have been involved. So we're fully supportive of the trail and always were. But we got a concern about it. When we seen the Rico McCacken uh, ball field, when we seen the school flooded, all these things that were just devastating in that community. So our staff and engineering have been trying to find a way. So they come up with a way and the community, at least the community that is using that trail. And we seen one gentleman talking about he'd rather, rather uh, uh, hear, uh, you know, uh, pumps running than, uh, than the, the forest being disturbed. Well, I get that, right? But is there a silent majority out there that don't feel like that? And I have to put my trust in the area councilor on this, and I, and I will. But I do want to ask about the money that's on the table currently, Wayne. I know governments have invested into this um, and timelines and what have you. Where does that stand as we put this off until we do this, if I can ask, please? Go ahead, Wayne. Thank you, councilor. Uh, so the project is in approximately, this phase of project is approximately two and a half million dollars. Um, we were funded back in uh, 2018. We received funding um, for the for the work. Um, to date, we are awaiting um, the beginning of construction. So, uh, the funding came from the federal government uh, through the provincial government through uh, disaster uh, mitigation uh, funding, and uh, that's where it stands today. Um, the money spent to date has been on, uh, on soft costs uh, outside of the Mud Lake project on uh, designs, tendering. The contractor has already been, uh, has been sitting waiting for regulatory uh, approval. So that's where we stand. Uh, we anticipate uh, the project, it, the plan is that the project would have been completed or would be completed this year. Um, we have extended the funding a few times. So uh, that would have to be a question back to the federal government if, for instance, council decide not to move forward, uh, would the money um, continue to exist? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. And uh, once again, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated with the uh, debate here. I, um, uh, like some of my other uh, colleagues, I, I had uh, several uh, emails from uh, concerned uh, uh, residents in the area, and uh, I also had a, uh, a couple of phone calls. Uh, and, and I might say uh, uh, people from uh, on both sides of the uh, equation, really, uh, the, the uh, overwhelming majority of the emails, of course, were people saying, uh, uh, put the brakes on. But uh, I had a, uh, a phone call from uh, an old friend who happens to uh, live in the area uh, in, down in the, uh, in the south end there, whose uh, home was directly impacted by that uh, flood in, uh, in 2016. And, and, uh, and I don't know this, and perhaps uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, I'll, I'll ask uh, Councillor Perouche, but uh, apparently there have been uh, studies done on this, but um, so you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, our engineering department just didn't uh, decide uh, out of thin air to, uh, okay, th this is what we're going to do and uh, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, uh, do it. Now, uh, when uh, Councilor Peru says uh, it's not going to fix the uh, uh, problem, well, that's a big problem. There's no question. If, if, we're, if we're going to uh, um, uh, do uh, landscaping and the like, uh, and it's not going to uh, solve the, uh, the the problem for the people in the uh, down in the uh, south end there, whose homes are directly impacted by uh, by flooding and the like, then uh, you know it, it is incumbent on us to uh, uh, go back to the proverbial uh, uh, drawing board. 
Uh, in fact, I had on my in my notes here. I was going to ask uh, Wayne McDonald to uh, speak on the uh, on the topic, and he has. So uh, when he says he he can uh, come back to us uh, uh, in two months or so with uh, uh, pros and cons of the uh, uh, of the uh, subject, I think that's a uh, a good. Uh, a good way to uh, go for us, just so that we can have a firm grasp on it, because it's a a, a very uh, a, a passionate uh, debate that we're having here from both sides of the equation. Again, I repeat myself: there are people who who want to uh, use the trail for mind therapy and uh, fitness and the like, and uh, then there are people down in the uh, uh, who are uh, uh, impacted by uh, flooding and the like. So. Uh, we have to uh, get it right, and uh, um, you know, I, I was interested to hear Councillor Brookswagger as well, because I'm sure uh, that he was involved in uh, the uh, previous uh, decision to uh, go ahead with uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, construction or or manipulation of the uh, area there. So uh, it, it, it's very uh, interesting, and uh, uh, for sure. Uh, uh, because uh, we're told that uh, it's not going to uh, fix the problem, uh, I, I don't think we have any choice but to, uh, to go back to the drawing board to uh, get it right. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, what I will add to our action list here today is to make sure that that engineer's report around flood mitigation options can be recirculated to everybody. Um, and also make sure that the links to the previous meetings that we've held as council um, up to and deciding on these options are shared too. It's, it's very helpful, I think, just to have that as a, as a backup resource. Okay, um, Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, like my fellow councillors too, I, I've received numerous emails and phone calls and people just walking by all, all expressing the same uh, concern to me. They want me to preserve this trail. And uh, I know it's hard to tell looking at me, but I've been to the trail a few times myself. My wife and I used to walk that trail a few years ago, but I did do it a few times. And, and uh, I will be fully supporting uh, Councillor Bruce's motion on this as well, too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Glenn Parish. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. That, that was good, O'Quinn. I like that. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, I, my father always told me to think before, before I speak, and at 40 years old, I'm still having a hard problem with doing that. So I should have started off by saying all the hard work that I know that uh, Mr. Matt Viva and Wayne and the rest of the staff have done over the years towards this, uh, towards this mitigation, it, that, that's not, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't go without saying. And the same like these trails, these trails are near and dear to my heart. These trails have been, I've been driving on those trails with my bike when they weren't paths. It was just a bike path. So, you know, this is, uh, this is a gem in the city. It's, it's country living in the city limits. So I just have to say uh, thank you to the uh, tireless hours that the volunteers have put in to make it so that the people throughout the CBRM uh, can use this space and will continue to use this space. And by, by pumping the brakes on this tonight, and I hope I can get everyone's support, it's, I'm not saying that we don't have to come up with a flood mitigation design. I just think that we have to change the way that we think going forward. And I'll just end it on a quick quote that I saw on the uh, Bel Air Trail. When, when it's man-made and it gets damaged, it's called vandalism. But if you take something in nature and, and disrupt it, it's called progress. That's the type of progress I don't want to be involved with. You got to, if this was in Halifax, and I know we use Halifax all the time. If this was Point Pleasant Park, they would just say, okay, it's a no flood zone. You're, you can't build in the green space anymore. Move on. We're not destroying a century old forest. I planted over a million trees in my lifetime. I like trees. All right. Trees got me through university. Trees are provide oxygen, natural uh, infiltration with water, like the list goes on and on. So folks, I, I urge you all just to, uh, to support this tonight. And as a community, I'm happy, I'm happy for all the support that we've had and uh, we're here to make our community better. And this is, this is one small feat for us that's gonna last a lifetime. We talked about it with the port. 
it's for our children and our children's children. So, I mean, same rules apply here, folks. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Elder McDonald, followed by Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll start off by, by saying that uh, I appreciate all the work and effort that staff have put into this file uh, since the flood uh, five years ago, basically, uh, and including the last uh, year and a half. Um, I will say that, um, you know, looking at people referencing Point Pleasant Park, um, I've been there. Uh, it's a beautiful spot. I dare say if it was next to the water uh, issues that we have uh, down in the south end and there was people losing their homes and, and schools at risk and churches at risk in Point Pleasant Park, I'm sure Point, the people in Halifax would be looking to try to find a solution. Uh, they're very fortunate not to be in the situation that we're in, 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 in a low-lying uh, flood risk area. Um, and, I, and I will say that, you know, I'll, I'll, and I say this with all due respect, appreciate all the emails that I've gotten, appreciate all the efforts by staff, but I'll make my decision based on, I guess if I can steal the term with COVID, on science and engineering. Uh, I won't be making my decision based on emotion. Uh, what I'm going to be looking for is clear direction from our staff, and I will ask Matt to speak to this if I could uh, after I'm, I'm finished here, Madam Mayor. But for me, uh, when I hear the terms, the bare layered trails are going to be destroyed, I, I equate that to, say, a house or a car. If you destroy my house, I will no longer live in it. It is no longer of any use. If you destroy my car, I will probably never drive it again. I will probably have to get a replacement for that vehicle because it's been destroyed. If we destroy the Berlard trails, and I'm a trail user, I've walked the Berlard trails many, many times on a daily basis. I know every trail, I know it very well. I've walked it for many years. Those trails are very important to me and to our community and to also attracting doctors and families and professionals that want to come live in our community, that's an asset to help attract people to come to our community. But to say that the trails are going to be destroyed would tell me that once this work is carried out, I will no longer be able to walk on the trail in Bel Air. That's what destroyed means to me personally. And I don't think that that's going to be the case. Now, are we going to be altering a portion of the trails, the many trails that are through there? Absolutely, there's going to be an alteration of those trails. But to say that they're going to be destroyed means they're no longer going to exist. We will never be able to use them again. I don't think that's the case, but Matt can speak to that. We've got the Susan McCachran field uh, that floods regularly down there that we've got millions of dollars invested in and will continue to, to receive damage if we don't take as many steps as we can to try to mitigate it. We have a church that uh, I believe April just passed where we had a fairly small amount of rain compared to five years ago, where where parishioners' cars had their back tires now in water when when they were in, it went to church there and came out the front tires weren't in water but the back of the car was. Uh, not much water fell in April compared to that, and I suspect we'll have much more damage and heavy storms coming at us over the coming years than what we had our past April. When I hear the term, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It is broke. Go talk to the people that don't live there anymore. And I know some of those people personally that their homes no longer exist and they're gone and they lost everything in their family and their lives and their memories. Go ask them if it's broke and I'm sure they would tell you it is. So it is broke. Can we fix it? No, Alexander told us there's no permanent fix that you can say, if we do this, you will never have a flood again. You will never have a water issue again. But he also said, that we need to take as many steps as possible to mitigate and to put as much protection in place as we can. If we do that in the Berlard Forest, which I believe that's mostly where the work will take place, I'm not into wanting to destroy anything, but I'm willing to, to, to look at the issue and how we can move forward. When we originally made this decision in council, it, I, I believe it was supported unanimously to move forward. The Berlard Trail Group adamantly opposed what we were going to do. And Matt can speak to this. The last year and a half to two years, I'll say, uh, that plan that we agreed to has been significantly altered by a plan that was submitted by the Barrier Trail people, by, by consultants that they hired to alter and change what we originally agreed, agreed to. And over the last two years through consultation and work with the Barrier Trail people, our staff and CBCL, and, and I'm not speaking specifics, but Matt can, you know, altered that plan 
based on the plan submitted by the Bear Lair Trail folks. And I believe back around the first of this year, it was agreed upon by all parties that we had something we could move forward with. This is about working to find compromise, to work with all entities and both entities. And I think our staff have been very good to work with the Bear Lair Trail to find the best possible solution to move forward, to mitigate the flood. When we time. With... Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Councillor Steve Gillespie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall, and uh, kind of will continue on uh, what uh, Councillor Elder McDonald had said. Uh, I'm going to support the issue paper. I know that may come as a surprise to my nemesis there, Glenn Perouche, but uh, <clears throat> you know, if they, we need to take a pause and, and uh, look at what has been done up to this point, it's a good idea. I look at what can be done in the future, that's a good idea too. Uh, a lot of misnomers out there in the community. Uh, I, not only do we need an issue paper, but I believe that council needs an education on what this project is, how it started, why it was put in place, and what the repercussions of it will, you know, could possibly happen over time. Um, as uh, Councillor Sarah McDonald and Councillor Glenn Bruce said, yes, I did ask the question, will this fix the problem? Fix the problem. And uh, the engineer said, no. But what he said after that was, we cannot fix problems like this, but we can mitigate the flooding and allow for a distrib better distribution of water. So I asked the question, because I wanted to know the answer. Now, oddly enough, it was Councillor Glenn Perusha's father who beat me into submission to make sure that I voted for this. And now we have Glenn who's trying to say, no, 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 that's not the way. My question to Glenn is, do you have a daughter or son that's gonna get into politics in five years and maybe change this again? Two, oh great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be gone by then, thank God. Um, the, other quite, the other couple of questions I have for this is, uh, you know, to Dimitri Kachavanis, knowing that there is a problem and knowing that there is a kind of a solution, where does that put us legally to the individuals who live at the end of this waterway who consistently get flooded? They have been asking us for years, as Councilor Brookschweiger pointed out, decades, please, do what you can to fix it. I'd also like to know, who are we really dealing with here? Where is David Gabriel? I have heard nothing from him uh, or the, the official association. I have heard from groups, the Friends of the, the Trail, uh, the Save the Trail group. I'd like to know who we're dealing with here. So there's a, there's a number of issues that I would like to be addressed. And I hope that we can address all of them. And as I indicated, I'll support this. Things have changed in the last couple of years. Yes, there's no doubt about that. But I was on that site in 2016 when the rain was coming down. I stood next to the six of the nine families that I knew personally who lost their home. This wasn't a little bit of water in the basement. This was nine feet of water in the host from the basement up to and including the first floor of most of these houses. I just happened to be there because I was trying to get to my dad's place for a Thanksgiving dinner. I also went to the meeting at Center 200, dragged there, might I add, uh, by former Councillor Ray Perouge, to listen to the stories and listen to the people when they had these concerns. So if we can pause for a little while, find out how we can educate ourselves on the issue and then come back and, and listen to the engineers. I'm okay with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just, I, I do want staff to offer their insight and, and opinion. Um, one of the things that you did bring up, uh, Councillor Gillespie was where is the Bail Art group where is Dave Gabriel? Where is the organization? So Councilor Perouche, myself, staff members have been meeting with, with the group, ensuring that they are up to date on where the 
the current berm project stands. Um, we have another meeting set for the 21st of June as well as a follow up to this thing. So that communication is is ongoing um, and we plan to continue that. Yes, and my question with that, Mayor, what wasn't that, and I knew that those were happening. My question was, with everything that's happening in the community now on social media and what's been happening, who are we talking to? Who are we dealing with? There's, there's been people in the newspaper saying that this is their trail. But is the if we're working with the group, that's who we should be working with. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And I appreciate Just that. For clarity, your time has uh, concluded. Um, the trail does belong to the wider community. Um, there is a volunteer group that are the stewards of the trail and to maintain the trail, um, but they do not feel like they they should be the people who are communicating in regards to a CBRM project on the trail. It, that's our responsibility. So we are talking to them, making sure they're up to date. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to Matt and Wayne to offer the insight to Councillor Gillespie's uh, comments. Hey, Matt. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I, I can jump in and actually I can back up to uh, Councillor McDonald's uh, few comments there. He made a few points. Um, as most of you probably know that the original motion um, to move forward with option 15 included uh, the directive for staff to work with the Bel Air Trail as the detailed design progressed from just the conceptual level, which you may remember was six to eight berms that stretched across the entire site of where the Bel Air trails exist. Um, so that's what we did from really day one, from when we, we moved from preliminary design into detailed design, we met with David Gabriel and some folks from the trail group, um, which ultimately resulted into the, the three berms that you see today that actually, I think uh, it was in 2019, I brought a presentation to council uh, to update uh, mayor and council uh, um, at that time on what the detailed design looked like after much debate with the trail group. So um, in terms of your specific question, Councillor McDonald, uh, the continuity of the trail system was one of the um, original concerns that the trail group brought forward. And that, that has really been uh, maintained throughout the entire design process. So the the trail system will, will remain connected um, when the project is complete. Um, I believe there's three locations throughout the entire system that will actually have to come in contact with a, with a section of the trail, but of course that would be restored to original conditions. So um, the majority of the trail will remain untouched. Um, the, the position of the three berms is, is um, the best way I can describe it is, is off the beaten path. Um, it's, it's, it's more in the forested area versus being directly overlaid top of the berms. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question, Councillor McDonald. And, um, um, and I don't know, uh, Councillor Gillespie, if, if that answers your concern as well um, about working with Bell Aird from day one. Uh, we've met with them numerous times with the consultant, the engineering consultant in the room as well. So uh, they've been a major contributor to the detailed design process and how the berms uh, appear today. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, so kindly. Um, just a quick note, folks. Uh, it is uh, almost nine o'clock. Just need an agreement of council to continue past our nine o'clock hour. So move. Give you a motion. Great. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, Elton. It's late. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue on now. Um, thank you again, Matt and, and Wayne. Um, we have Councillor Ken Tracy now on the speaker's list. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, for, uh, I, I just want to go on record by saying that I support the motion by Councillor Perush, but I'm also very much interested in uh, listening to uh, more of what uh, Matt and Director McDonald have to say. I appreciate Matt's comments now. Uh, it you know opens up a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's basically all I'd like to say. And, and the fact that uh, I want to thank the uh, constituents of the area that have reached out to, uh, to me with numerous emails and 
and some phone calls, people that I know that live in the area. There's uh, arguments on both sides of the table here. So, uh, you know, again, I look forward to listening uh, more of the pros and cons of what, uh, what um, Director McDonald has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cyril McDonald on your second opportunity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wish I hadn't spoken already, but I'll squeeze it all in in two minutes. So a uh, couple of things. I, I just, uh, I reminisce to the Thanksgiving Day flood and I remember it well. Uh, all of my neighbors flooded and uh, fortunately we were dry. Um, but people on hills, on the tops of hills, experienced water in their basements. That was an extraordinary storm, uh, not typical to our, uh, our Cape Breton climates, although very unfortunate and devastating to many. Uh, I, will, uh, I will say that uh, I was much younger than Steve Gillespie, but uh, it was an extra, extraordinary storm. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, to the to the comments earlier about uh, about destroying the trails, I would say that this uh, this destroys a good portion of these trails. That probably the part that's the oldest of the trail, which I would say dates back 100, 150 years old. If you, uh, I, I'm obviously I wasn't around, but uh, some of the largest trees, some of the oldest, uh, some of the oldest parts of the trail. Um, probably the part that people value the most. Uh, the bulldozers have to get into that part of the, uh, have to get into that, uh, that place in the trail. Also, um, you know, that means that uh, as a result, the, the trail that leads to the oldest part of said trail uh, is then destroyed and cannot be replaced, or essentially it would take another 150 years to replace uh, you can go buy a new car, but you can't buy a 150-year-old tree. Uh, I think the uh, the the um, I'll say historic value. Um, you know, there, there's there's so many factors that that come into effect here. I agree. The residents that are affected directly in the area, I I feel for them and I sympathize with them. Um, you know, uh, hopefully, and and I, I go back to our Center 200 debate. We are essentially discussing the issue paper, and I'll leave it at that. So. Thanks, Madam Thanks. Mayor. Great. On your second opportunity, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And uh, I fully support uh, Council Proosh asking for this to come forward because uh, we need to have the new information that that, that uh, Council needs to be educated on. Uh, but I will go back to Matt, uh, if I could, uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Matt, what I will expect uh, for you to, I don't know if you can speak to it now, but to have information uh, I have been told, and again, hearing that the forest is, or, or this, pardon me, the trails are going to be destroyed. I've also heard that there's going to be approximately 36 feet of the trail affected. And I can tell you from someone who walks it, I don't know how many thousands of feet of trails in there, but there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of feet. Uh, and it's my understanding there's approximately 36 feet that, that may be affected. Um, I would like for that information to be tried to so, be sourced out when they come back with the information to us. Uh, so that we have a, a better idea on what's accurate, not accurate. As I said, I don't want to make my decisions based on emotions. I want to make, make it based on factual evidence that, that our engineering department and staff can bring back to us. So Matt, can you just speak to that in regards to, I guess, destroying the, the trails uh, and, and if you have any idea what the actual footage is or approximate? Yeah, sure. Um, so Councillor, we can... Uh, as part of our issue paper, when we come back um, next month or, or um, whenever we just, whenever it's decided that will take place, we can certainly bring, you know, uh, key points and tidbits of information like that. Um, I don't know the exact footage of trail that will actually be directly impacted. I believe there are three crossings of the trail. So like uh, the best way I can describe it is a perpendicular crossing of the berm where the trail exists. So um, we, I can bring it, we can bring it back. No problem. Do I have any time left mayor? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, you had two seconds, but I didn't think it would be enough to say anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, deputy mayor, Erlene McMullen on your second opportunity. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just very quickly, I love the idea of the education. There's a lot to ponder and I'd like to, you know, see where everything is. I get that, but I do hope that we could have it on both sides. Um, not so much just a representative of the trail system, but perhaps someone who um, has the education and background of the benefits of natural growth and forest and, you know, not somebody somebody independent, just like we'd have an engineer to talk about that, somebody to come in and talk about the importance of these kind of, of things, because it's it's a, it's a two-way street, and I don't know a lot about either, so all information will be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, next, Councillor Lauren Green. Madam Mayor, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to comment on the Bel Air Trail, but I, um, I'm disappointed in Council to you know, we're actually debating the issue. We asked for an issue paper. Here we are an hour into it, and we're going to do the same thing when the issue paper comes back. Uh, exactly what we talked about as the council not doing, um, we've done here this evening, and we've done it to great, great, great standards. And I just, uh, you know, it's disappointing. All we need to do is move the issue paper and bring it back, and all these comments will be hashed out again when we bring the issue paper back. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Steve Gillespie, and your second opportunity. Oddly enough, I was going to uh, say exactly what uh, Councillor Green had just said. Uh, you know, the request is for the issue paper. Uh, but uh, on top of that, um, my request is that we, we have an education. And as uh, uh, Deputy Mayor McMullen had indicated, let's get as many people to the table as possible. Uh, if there are these, and I'm using the wrong term, and you know, don't attack me. If there are these fringe groups that are that use the trail on a regular basis and are organized, uh, then then you know somebody should could represent those groups as well as long as the Bellier Trail. You know, the Nova Scotia government, uh, you know, who and the federal government who is actually paying for all of this, um, you know, could be a part of it as well. I think the more education, the more input we have, the better. Um, but as uh, as it was indicated uh, by Elder McDonald and. I guess this scares me the most. I agree with what uh, Councillor Elder McDonald is saying, and uh, is that um, you know the the science, the education, um, and uh, the opportunity to work together will uh, will solve this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Council, for some very, very thoughtful opinion on this matter. Okay, bear with me for a second here. Now we can move to item nine on the agenda, corporate services issues. Uh, 9.1 is the taxi bylaw amendment request. Uh, I look to Paul Burt. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. I'm just going to share my screen and just bring the memo up. Bear with me for a second. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that in the screen. It's on page 77 of your agenda package. Uh, it's just a very short issue. We're looking for a little direction tonight. Uh, the Planning and Development Department has received a request to amend CBRM's taxi bylaw uh, to allow for use of new technology for the taxi industry. <clears throat> this is a new applicant. He's not currently licensed or operating, but he wants to open up a, a taxi business. He's, uh, his request includes amending the definition of a taxi to include some additional vehicles, uh, to eliminate the service areas, to allow for a different dispatch options, and to allow the use of software to calculate rates. Many of the applicants' amendments being requested were raised during the discussion of the General Committee back in November of 2019 at which time the general committee approved a motion to review and update the taxi bylaw in its entirety. You can see a copy of that motion on the previous page on page 76. The CBRM gets its authority under the Motor Vehicle Act to give council the authority to regulate and license the taxi industry, which we currently do. So today we're just looking at a little direction based on the existing motion. Uh, which we haven't done yet. Uh, we've had an election and COVID in the meantime, so staff haven't been able to do that thorough review yet. Um, so what we're looking for is a little bit of uh, direction from council today. And the options I'm presenting are, we can just uphold the existing bylaw and decline the, the applicant's request for the amendments. 
uh, council can direct staff to draft an issue paper outlining the potential options for the applicant's amendments. Or council can direct staff to initiate the review of the taxi bylaw in its entirety. This would involve establishment of a working group consisting of representatives of the taxi industry, taxi users, interested parties, members of the public, uh, CBRM staff, and a member of council. So we believe because uh, you know the, the change in council and some of the change in the client of the taxi industry in the last couple of years, uh, as well as this new uh, request, we would like to get council's recommendation on how to proceed with this request. If there's any questions, I can certainly answer them. I have a question. I'd like Go to- Go ahead, Kel oh. oh, sorry about that, Mayor. Um, Go ahead. Having a little trouble with my screen. Uh, I would like to move the motion that we uh, use option three. Um, at one point in time, back in uh, 2019, I did request a, a, a review of the taxi bylaw. And I think that the option number three gives us the opportunity to work with the taxi industry, as well as the other groups uh, to, uh, uh, to make this happen. So I'm going to uh, move a motion to accept option number three. Okay. okay, moved by Councillor Steve Gillespie, seconded by Deputy Mayor Earlene McMullen that we direct staff to initiate a review of the taxi bylaw in its entirety. Um, any discuss? Oh, sugar. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor, please signify. Sorry, Madam Mayor, my uh, chat box is not working here. I do have one question in regards to the background information. Go ahead, um, Paul. Through you to Paul, if I could. Um, the applicant that's uh, applying here um, for the for the uh, taxi license indicates he would like the to have an amendment to the definition of a taxi to include a hatchback. Can you elaborate on that as to why they wouldn't be allowed to use a hatchback now? I believe in the, the initial taxi bylaw was created, it was through a working group that involved the industry. And I think back then, you know, a hatchback wasn't quite what it was today. You know, you're probably thinking of those little sub compact cars versus, you know, some of the bigger cars that are available today. You know, the body of vehicles has changed. So as you know, most people drive SUVs versus cars anymore. So at the time, I think, you know, they wanted to have some professionalism in the industry. You know, they wanted a cab that was truly a cab that was, you know, large and comfortable. So it did set some specifications in the bylaw for size and, and some other vehicle requirements. So I believe at the time, you know, a hatchback was probably considered a very subcompact car and wasn't considered to be suitable at the time. If, if, the, if the applicant's amendment was only to add the term hatchback to the bylaw, this would be a very simple. Uh, we'd be going probably with an issue paper to support his request, but the big heart of his request is really around the issues that were with the tax industry back in 2019. You know, the current bylaw has zones. Uh, current bylaw is very specific on the type of equipment that's to be in the car and a dispatch. Um, and staff believe, you know, based on council's direction in 2019, that it is time to review the bylaw. And so some of the stuff that's, you know, almost in a 20 year old bylaw right now is probably, probably due to be changed. Okay. Thank you. No. Thank you. Is any further discussion? <laughs> Question. Question. Question called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Thank Paul. you, and we'll staff will initiate this as soon as possible. We'll get back Perfect. to you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, next, we have item 9.2, appointment of development officer. Uh, I will ask Director of Planning and Development, Michael Roos, to take the virtual stage. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good evening, folks. I'm um, just going to share my screen. So the uh, memo is on page 78 of your um, agenda. And uh, yeah, looking for council's appointment of Colleen Clare as a uh, development officer for CBRM. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, fill a, a long time vacant position and uh, found Colleen Clare who 
uh, has been working with CPRM for some time, but also has experience as a planner working in New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia for a number of years. So we're very happy to have her on board and uh, this will help to expand our development review capacity. Move the recommendation, Madam Mayor. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Eldon McDonald, seconded by Councillor Steve Gillespie to appoint Colleen Clare as a development officer for the CDRM. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Question. 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 Question's been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary nay. Motion is carried and please extend our warmest congratulations uh, to Colleen, please, Director. I certainly will, thank you. Lee, don't go too far, you're up next. Okay, on to our next agenda item, uh, bylaws and motions continued. Um, parking meter bylaw T5 proposed amendments. Uh, amendments, I'm sorry. Um, Director Roos. Sorry, I'm just uh, pulling up the page. One fifty seven. Yes. On um, yeah, page one fifty eight is um, a continuation of our discussion regarding the parking area request from Brett Brewing. Um, so as I've noted um, in at previous meetings, and uh, senior planner Karen Neville filled in for me at the last meeting. Uh, Brett and Brewing is currently evaluating options for a potential location in downtown Sydney. Um, however, due to the nature of their business and the lack of dedicated parking spaces, uh, they would need dedicated on-street parking spaces for the purpose of loading and unloading. Uh, just because of the byproducts of the, from the production of um, beer, which requires removal daily to avoid pests and potential odor in the downtown. So at the council meeting on May 18th, a motion was passed by council directing staff to um, and CBRM's parking meter bylaw for the designation of parking spaces uh, for property owners. Um, so I'll just highlight the uh, amendment that was chosen by council at that meeting and what is drafted before you and attached. Uh, this uh, particular amendment uh, prescribes a fee for spaces. Uh, so currently CBRM charges $220 a month and uh, this amendment would, would prorate that uh, current fee for the designation of parking spaces associated with a specific property uh, for the time um, designated. And the criteria for el eligible properties as discussed at the last meeting would be uh, properties which house a manufacturing use, which require daily access to the building for the purpose of loading and unloading of goods. And, uh, Lastly, there'd be limits for the time designated. So spaces would be designated for specific hours of weekdays, uh, no more than three hours daily. Um, now I did circulate uh, an email that came through today from the Sydney Downtown Development Association as discussed with council at the last meeting. We did reach out to them and uh, had a discussion about the uh, proposed amendment uh, requested by the applicant and Sydney Downtown Development has indicated that they're in, in support of the proposed amendment. However, they wanna have a larger conversation about you know, generally parking and loading within the Sydney Downtown at a future date. And so given all that, uh, our recommendation at this time respectfully is that council give first reading and proceed to give notice of an upcoming public hearing of the proposed amendment. So, so moved, seconded. You have to forgive me. I can't see everybody's faces. I think that was moved by Councillor Steve Parsons and seconded by Councillor Eldon McDonald. Um, any further discussion on this motion? Question. Question's been called. 
All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Thank you kindly, Council. Motion is carried. Thank you, Director Roos, as well. Thank you, Council. Okay. So we have now reached item 11 of the agenda. So just a quick recap of some of the action items from our meeting tonight. Um, I, I did note during the PAL Airlines presentation um, that perhaps I can reach out or staff can reach out to uh, public health and help get that information to everybody uh, in regards to what might be happening with testing. So will that be happening at airports? Is that Halifax? Will there be options for Sydney? Um, I, you know, we, we've talked a lot tonight about advocacy work, and I think this is a piece of advocacy work that, you know, our Chamber of Commerce, um, the Cape Breton Partnership, the airport all together have been advocating for really good testing practices and, and support from all levels of government. So that will be something we can follow up on. Of course, uh, our, our biggest conversation from the night uh, in regards to the flood mitigation project and impact on Baylard Trail. So, of course, that issue paper has been requested. Um, noted is the need to explore what happens in terms of the funding that is already in place. Is there opportunity for funding amendments uh, or project changes? Also um, making sure that we circulate the engineer's report that we do have on all of the flood mitigations op options that were presented to council. Um, in that, also important is to include, um, you know, council, if you have the opportunity, please go back and watch the previous council meetings where this was very, very well discussed. The presentations are made by the engineers, questions were asked, that's really, really helpful stuff. Um, again, the stakeholders group, so the actual volunteer group that, that are stewards of the trail and ma maintainers of the trail system, we are meeting with them again on the 21st of June, uh, that myself, staff, and, and the area councilor Glenn Perouche will be there. Um, we, can, we can provide a bit of a summary to all of council after that as well. And finally, uh, including an ecologist's opinion in this. I think that's what I was hearing in terms of the, the scientific expert. Um, I, I, I thought perhaps, you know, reaching out to UINR who have really wonderful forest management professionals there, uh, that is an awesome option too. And also works through the, the two eye uh, seeing lens as well. Um, if I've missed anything, by all means, let me know. But otherwise, seeing no for further items on our agenda, uh, I will, call this meeting closed.